We'd like to thank you for coming today. We'd like to call to order this uh, public hearing on resolution number six on proposed amendments to the economic provisions of the Constitution. This uh, is a continuation of our hearing a few days ago on uh, educational institutions. So we'll continue on that. And uh, first, we'd like to acknowledge our guests present from uh, the public and the private sectors. We have from our national government agencies, we have Commission on Higher Education Chairperson, Dr. Prospero de Verde III. Morning, sir. Dole, our Department of Labor and Employment Under Secretary Felipe Egargo Jr. Department of Education Assistant Secretary Francis Bringas. Morning. Uh, tech from the TechVoc Education and R and D Research and Development Institutions from Mindanao State University Iligan Institute of in Technology Chancellor Alizedni Ditukalan. Morning. Uh, from UP Los Banos Chancellor Jose Camacho. Morning po. POST Philippine Science High School System Deputy Executive Director Rod Alan Delara. From the Government Academy Industry Network. Incorporated or GAIN Executive Director Dr. Genevieve Ledesma Laurel. From the International Rice Research Institute of the Philippines, Senior Council Attorney Eugeniano Perez. And the TUP or Technical Technological University of the Philippines, Representative Attorney Christopher Mortel. And uh, also from our other government agencies, the DTI Philippines Trade Training Center Executive Director Naili Dillera. Here's uh, Legal Officer Attorney Lani Salazar, Bureau of Immigration Senior Immigration Officer Anthony Cabrera. Yeah, morning to you. Uh, Philippine Chamber of Commerce and Industry, ECCI Vice President and Semiconductor and Electronics Industries in the Philippines Foundation or SAP Chairman Ferdinand Perry Ferrer. Morning, sir. Uh, National Scientist Dr. Carmencita Patilla. Ma'am, why are you there? <laughs> You want to come to the table, please? Uh, Dr. Ethel Agnes Pascua Valenzuela, former Southeast Asian Minister of Education or CIMEO uh, Secretariat. Where is she? Dr. Ethel Agnes Pascua Valenzuela. Not here. Okay. Uh, Dr. Alvin Culaba, Vice President and Academic Academician of the National Academy of Science and Technology. Dr. Jose Ramon Albert from Philippine Institute of Development Studies or PIDS. Attorney Antonio Eduardo Natura Jr. from Acralo. Morning, sir. Uh, and of course, in previous, are they present? Also present are those who have uh, spoken in the previous meeting Dr. Sikat, uh, Edcom Chief Legal Officer, Attorney Estrada, PRC Director Melissa Comafe, and OIC Division Chief Rosales. Uh, Paco representative Joshua Alexander Calaguas. Uh, that's it for now. And again, we thank you for your presence, uh, your honors. So we'll, as you can see, we've got uh, several guests. So we'll turn it over to the body for uh, your feedback, which is much appreciated. We'll start with uh, more or less we'll follow the order of uh, recognition. So we'll ask uh, the Commission on Higher Education, Dr. Devera, to give his uh, views on charter change. Morning, sir. Good morning. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to uh, speak in this uh, in this hearing. Uh, I will make my presentation very short because I'm really more interested in answering questions if there are any. Uh, but uh, basically, the Commission interposes no objection to the proposal to amend the Constitution to open up control and administration of higher education institutions to foreign nationals. Uh, number one, so that we will be able to provide additional options to students who want to pursue their education in foreign universities here, help internationalize uh, higher education, facilitate university to university linkages between Philippine and foreign universities, and increase foreign student enrollment in Philippine uh, in the Philippines. But all of this will, of course, depend on the enabling law that will be passed by Congress pursuant to the constitutional amendment. The enabling law must provide incentives for 
foreign universities to locate here, it must uh, be able to ensure uh, complementarity between Philippine and foreign universities, ensure that control over the curriculum and other administrative matters remains with the Philippines, with the ministry or with CHED, but more important, we, uh, we are happy that this is being discussed because it allows us to reopen discussions on the framework for higher education, particularly on how to improve quality in higher education, how to ensure that our Philippine universities are competitive, and the kind of interventions and policies that the government must put in place to ensure access to quality higher education. Uh, with that, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I am ready to answer any questions. Well, maybe what we do is the procedure, uh, Sec, is we really go around the table first and then we allow questions from our colleagues. So we'll do that. Thank you, uh, Dr. Devera. Can we go to Dole, Yusek uh, uh, Felipe Gargo Jr.? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. The uh, Department of Labor and Employment expresses its support to the ongoing hearings of the Senate Committee on Constitutional Amendments in its efforts to know the pulse of the people, the government bureaucracy, civil society, legal luminaries, and the entire Filipino nation in whether or not the amendments or revision to the Constitution can be executed by the insertion of the praise unless otherwise provided by law. Section 9, Article 2, in relation to Paragraph 1, Section 3 of Article 13 of the Philippine Constitution, provides that it is the policy of the state to promote full employment and equality of employment opportunities for all. In order to carry out the said objectives, the state has to work hard in inviting numerous foreign investors to invest or establish enterprises in the country that will eventually generate more jobs opportunities for the Filipinos. Hence, the proposal to amend certain restrictive economic provisions of the 1987 Philippine Constitution, particularly Articles 12, 14, and 16, will allow foreign businesses to breeze into more conducive investment landscape. It is indubitable that promotion of full employment and the equality of employment opportunities for all its, is the breath of life of the department and attracting foreign investors to invest in the country is indispensable in order to fulfill the policies of the state and mandates of the department. It is therefore appropriate to support the initiative of Congress to full employment and economic development. However, we must ensure that the insertion of the praise otherwise provided by law in some restricted economic provisions of the 1987 Philippine Constitution particularly Articles 12, 14, and 16, will not contravene the Filipino first policy enshrined also in the 1987 Philippine Constitution, as expounded by the Honorable Court in the Manila Prince Hotel versus Government Insurance System. We wish to inform the uh, committee chair and the mem honorable members of the committee that the department will submit its specific comments on the resolution. Maraming salamat po. Salamat, Yuseke Gargo. Can we hear from DepEd, the ASEC bring us? To, to the honorable chair of this committee, Senator Angara, uh, please allow me to read the position of the department with regards to the uh, resolution number six, uh, particularly paragraph two, section four of article four of the 1987 Philippine Constitution. Uh, this is reference to the request to submit a position paper on resolution number six by both houses of Congress titled resolution of both houses of Congress proposing amendments 
to certain economic provisions of 1987 Constitution of the Republic of the Philippines, particularly Articles 12, 14, and 16, specifically the proposed amendment to Paragraph 2, Section 4, Article 14 of the 1987 Philippine Constitution. The Department is of the view that the proposed amendments by both houses of Congress to Paragraph 2, Section 4, Article 14 of the 1987 Philippine Constitution have far-reaching consequences and serious implications with respect to the mandate of the Department and the exercise of its functions. The phrase, unless otherwise provided by law and its underlying rationale could potentially serve as a gateway to expand the scope of control and administration over educational institutions, not solely by citizens of the Philippines, but by other entities as well. In this light, the scope and limits of control and administration are put into question, including the processes defining who, what, and how education shall be administered. The most basic question is, will it allow foreign entities to teach? For this, the department strongly objects to this amendment. Moreover, expanding the scope and control of administration over educational institutions to foreign entities may affect the programs and commitment of the department, specifically with respect to the implementation of the curriculum. During the foundational years of basic education, learners undergo crucial development across various areas, including physical, social, emotional, cognitive, and values. As this phase lays the foundation for future learning, it is essential that Philippine curriculum is exclusively implemented by Filipino citizens. This ensures alignment with the specific needs and context of the country. It is stressed that one of the key thrusts of the Dep Ed Matatag basic education agenda is the cultivation of learners' sense of nationality and identity as Filipinos through the Makabansa subject. Article 14, Section 3, provides that all educational institutions shall inculcate patriotism and nationalism. Having foreign entities control and administer basic education in the Philippines may run contrary to this undertaking. This begs the question, how can foreign entities who are not citizens of the Philippines and therefore may lack firsthand experience in Filipino culture and values effectively impart a sense of patriotism and nationalism to learners? Consequently, this may result in the possible dilution of the fundamental aspects of Filipino identity, culture, and values to be taught, and worse, endanger national security. In relation to national security, the removal of the third paragraph on the limits on the number of foreign nationals studying in the educational institutions and the prohibition of the establishment of educational institutions solely for foreigners, except for those created for foreign dignitaries and their dependents and for other foreign temporary residents, poses great risks on national security due to the lack of provisions for proper supervision and control over aliens in the Philippine territory. Moreover, this significantly diminishes the department's oversight of school supervision and management including but not limited to curriculum offerings, rooster of faculty, policies, programs, and matriculation. This susceptibility to external and foreign influence raises concern regarding national security as it may expose these educational institutions to infiltration and compromise. In view of the foregoing, this department strongly opposes the proposed amendment to paragraph 2, section 4, article 14 of the 1987 Philippine Constitution, specifically the vesting of full control and administration of basic education institutions to aliens through legislation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Sec Bringas. We'd like to acknowledge our colleague, uh, Senator Bato de la Rosa, the Senate uh, Chair of the Committee on uh, Public Order. Uh, morning, sir. Uh, I think your uh, position highlights the point or that we need more clarity in the language because the intention is not to liberalize basic education. The intent is to liberalize higher and uh, vocational and technical. So I think you can rest assured that we will not uh, open up basic education. That was touched on by several resource persons. Marami nagsabi last week na hindi nga dapat buksan. And at the outset of the educational institutions, uh, session, we already said the intention was not to uh, to open up a 
uh, basic education because nga yung importance of uh, values, uh, formation, uh, nationalism, among others. Yung exactly with what you said, uh, Asik. But my question is, uh, do you have a view on higher education? Or are, is your uh, authority to give a position limited only to basic education? Uh, the position of the department is uh, for for the um, the discussions on the tertiary education. Uh, we defer to the Commission on Higher Education, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, can we hear from Tesla Deputy Director General Rosana Ordineta? Morning, Pop. Good morning, Mr. Chair. The agency test acknowledges the necessity of reframing the nation's economic policy to keep up with the demands of our increasingly globalized age while considering and protecting the Filipino first policy that guides the economic provisions of our constitutions. With the technological advancement and evolving global standards that affects employment landscape and changing workforce needs, Due to the fourth and fifth industrial revolution, the way we live, work, and relate to one another has been changed, thus affecting our existing systems and processes. Anchored on the national TSD plan for 2023 to 2028, TESDA, the industry, the VET providers, and other stakeholders should come together to strengthen the TVET in the country as a source of skills, knowledge, and technology technology needed to drive employment and productivity. The TVET sector has to keep abreast with the modern educational needs to be relevant and responsive to the workforce needs of the community, the industry, and the economy in general. TESDA supports this amendment and welcomes foreign participation and cooperation to reinforce the educational and technological needs in higher level TVET qualifications. With the national demand to align with industry requirements and standards, TVET provision is capital intensive in terms of the state-of-the-art equipment and facilities, and foreign investments as such would provide learners and trainees better knowledge, skills, and experience as in the workplace. Further, foreign trainers can impart their expertise and provide guidance that learners and trainees can adopt and learn from. In technical vocational education and training, the term highly technical refers to specialized and advanced skills and knowledge required for specific technical fields. Highly technical aspects in TVET programs often involve in-depth training and expertise in areas such as advanced technology, mastery of cutting-edge technologies relevant to particular industry, specialized techniques, proficiency in specialized techniques, methods, and procedures, industry-specific knowledge, in-depth understanding of industry standards, regulations, and practices, advanced machinery operation, skillful operation of advanced machinery and equipment, problem-solving skills, ability to analyze and solve complex technical problems within the context of a particular trade or profession, research and development. In some cases, highly technical TVET programs may involve aspects of research and development, pushing the boundaries of innovation in a given field. This Highly technical aspects ensure that individuals completing TVET programs are equipped with specialized skills. Looking at the foreign ownership in the education sector in different countries in ASEAN, Malaysia, Vietnam, and Singapore allow 100% foreign ownership in education. The Philippines, together with Indonesia and Thailand, has a ceiling on foreign ownership. Moreover, Singapore is a regional leader in creating the regulatory framework to welcome and accommodate foreign investments. Thus, if you can see and observe, they have a highly technical Tibet sector. In Malaysia, generally 100% foreign ownership in private education is allowed. 
though this often depends upon the curriculum being taught, use of the national curriculum, whether alone or in hybrid, with foreign curriculum may limit the amount of foreign equity injection. Such uncertainty embodies one of the trickier issues for investors in Malaysia. Private education is highly regulated and lacking of clarity, although regulatory exceptions are available with approval of the Ministry of Higher Education. On the other hand, to safeguard the quality of Tibet provision, TESDA as the authority in Tibet in the country has the power and responsibility in the establishment of Tibet institutions and the regulation of Tibet provision, be it locally owned and or with foreign ownership. Through its quality assured process, the Unified Tibet Program Registration System or UTPRAS. This is an ISO system requires the mandatory registration of Tibet programs with TESTA. Please be assured, Mr. Chair, of the agency's readiness to provide its utmost support once this legislative measure is approved according to the formalities required by the Constitution and relevant laws and issuances. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, uh, Director Urdaneta. We ask, we go now to our, uh, any, we'd like to acknowledge our uh, chairperson of, uh, in the Senate of Basic Education and Ways and Means, Senator Wynne Gachalian. Morning, sir. Uh, well, any statements from our uh, uh, Senate, fellow senators? We'll continue if, yeah, Senator Bato. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ma'am Ordaneda. Hindi ko. Medyo yes, mahaba, Mr. Mahaba Senator. Yung, mahaba ba yung sinabi mo eh. Po. Gusto ko lang samares. Okay ka? Hindi. Okay po. Okay. okay. For okay. highly technical uh, courses po. Okay. Thank you for uh, a very uh, short and sweet question from uh, Senator De La Rosa. Next, we'll go to our tech book education and R&D institutions. Uh, uh, and maybe we'll intersperse with the private sector para may konting uh, uh, variety and flavor. So MSU Iligan, uh, Chancellor Tito Kalan is with us. Uh, you probably flew in just for this hearing, uh, Chancellor. Uh, thank you very much. So please, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning uh, to, to our colleagues and uh, to uh, our honorable senators. Uh, the Philippine government actively promotes foreign investments uh, to drive economic growth. Uh, in fact, uh, to liberalize the country's economic and encourage foreign investment, the Congress amended various laws, the Foreign Investment Act and the Public Service Act, for instance, to allow 100% foreign ownership to selected industries. However, despite the various amendments to existing laws, they are subject to restrictive economic provisions the 1987 Constitution. As such, there are still certain professions and industries that impose limits on foreign involvement, one of which is the limitation set under Article 14, Section 4 of the Constitution regarding educational institutions, particularly higher education and institutions. Nevertheless, despite the limitations set above, the Philippine Constitution remains dynamic to adapt to the needs of the changing times. In view of this, the proposed amendment to section 14, section four, number two of the constitution becomes imperative to align with the nation's directions toward globalizations and economic liberalizations and internationalizations of higher education in particular. Internationalization is rapidly growing among higher education institutions around the world. And scholars found that each EI opt to expand and deepen their international engagement to increase revenue, enhance prestige, and improve student learning. And from a competition policy perspective, opening each EI to foreign investment will lead to a more competitive higher education institutions. And we believe that this will benefit state universities and colleges as the government will be forced to put more funding for higher education institutions to compete with um, uh, higher education institutions controlled by foreign investment. However, as discussed by Goris of UNESCO International Institute for Higher Education, 
The implementations of policies on internationalizations of higher education requires substantial long-term investment that demands huge financial and human resources. This is seen as a challenge for HEI in the Philippines vying for internationaliz internationaliz internationalization due to constraints in organizational infrastructure and budget, among others. And we believe this constitutional amendment will address this gap. Having said that, uh, Mr. Chair, we support uh, this um, constitutional initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor. Uh, next, we'll hear from you, Pilos Banyas, Chancellor Jose Camacho. Morning, Pop. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chair. We support this uh, initiative. The University of the Philippines, Los Banyas, has uh, uh, derived the benefits of uh, internationalization and opening up our, uh, our uh, campus to best facilities and uh, expertise. UP Los Banos is currently engaged with transnational education program being initiated or funded by the Commission on Higher Education. We currently implement the dual PhD program with the University of Reading in the UK and with the Curtin University in uh, Australia. We are also uh, hosting the Nagoya University Asian Satellite Campus, Nagoya University in Japan is a producer of Nobel laureates. And uh, our access it is in terms of funding of PhD a scholarship of faculty members and researchers to get their PhD degree in Nagoya while doing their administrative work in the university. Sorry, Chancellor, to interrupt. But what was the Australian University? What was the name of the Australian? Uh, that's Curtin uh, University. In How do you spell that? Uh, C-U-R-T-I-N. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Right. and uh, continuing, uh, uh, furthermore, the Nagoya University, as I've uh, expounded earlier, uh, while being engaged with us in funding the PhD scholarship of our faculty members, uh, we have access to the number of facilities and equipment that Nagoya University gives to the university, uh, that Nagoya University gives to UP Los Manos. Every year, the PhD students uh, go to uh, Japan in Nagoya uh, to conduct their research, have access to seminars and facilities being conducted or being uh, organized by their uh, Japanese uh, professors. The University of the Philippines Los Banos is one of the first uh, campuses of UP uh, system that has been engaged, that has engaged uh, with internationalization, especially with uh, the presence of the International Rice Research uh, Institutes. The faculty members uh, coming from IRI act as uh, professors, as advisors, research professors of our PhD students. They go all, they uh, also co-published uh, uh, the research that they have conducted with uh, the professors coming from Erie. The professors from Erie also teach in UP Los Banos. So here you can see the uh, benefits of uh, opening up our uh, borders uh, to international uh, experience when it comes to higher education. For now, I would. Uh, uh, describe this uh, uh, experience of the university in Thank terms you. of international. Thank you very much, Chancellor. I would like to acknowledge the presence of our minority leader in the Senate Center, Coco Pimentel, uh, who has stated he's against it. So please direct your favorable comments to Senator Coco. <laughs> no, but seriously, uh, I'm just curious because, uh, Chancellor Camacho, you mentioned that you already have these existing partnerships with all these. Uh, reputable universities. How does liberalizing the constitutional provision uh, improve on that or further it? Could, could you go into detail a little bit? For one, uh, the university should have a reputation uh, for these foreign universities to engage with us. Uh, should for, have a reputation. I mean, let me rephrase that. Baka hindi clear yung question ko. My question is, you're already doing it. Yes, sir. So what does... Uh, when, when we, if, if we adopt this constitutional 
uh, provision, uh, uh, amendment subject to a plebiscite, of course, the people have to approve it. How does that uh, improve further upon what you're already doing? Yeah, sir, let me clarify that uh, our experience uh, uh, is only in terms of uh, uh, forging partnerships and uh, signing uh, uh, partnership initiatives when it comes to academic collaborations and research uh, engagements. Uh, I would say that uh, because of the reputation of the university, uh, the competencies of faculty, the expertise of the faculty, uh, the uh, quality of students that we that we recruit uh, would somehow have a bearing on uh, our uh, university partners, uh, international university uh, partners. So uh, uh, they would be interested to also engage with us, especially when uh, it comes to the kinds of uh, research, cutting edge uh, research and uh, publications uh, that our faculty and students would like to uh, engage with. Uh, Senator Wynn and then Senator Bato after. Yeah, Senator Wynn, go ahead. Just to follow up, Mr. Chairman. Um, Professor, uh, I, I heard earlier that you have partnerships already, and this is probably under the transnational uh, education law. But have you encountered any potential investors slash educa foreign education institutions uh, who... Uh, who um, desires ownership as a decision-making point rather than partnerships. There are limitations to both. No, There are also pros and cons to both. No, uh, But because UP is uh, exposed to a lot of these international institutions, and I heard that you have already engaged uh, some of these international uh, institutions, but have you encountered any comments that ownership administration slash control is important and is a very important decision-making point for them in order to set up shop here in the Philippines? I will say, sir, that uh, in terms of what had, what has been expressed by uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, investors, supposedly investors or uh, higher education uh, players uh, from their home countries, this would be in terms of uh, recruiting students uh, and in terms of uh, what has been expressed is in terms of uh, the equipment and the facilities uh, that they can uh, put up in the university. Provided that uh, uh, the students and uh, faculty members uh, of the university can, can uh, be engaged in co-publication and uh, for instance, in on uh, a student and uh, faculty mobility from uh, their uh, home country. In other words, that there should be a uh, uh, an active engagement. But as regard to uh, a, a a tangible uh, investment in the in the university, that we have not encountered yet, sir. Thank you, Senator Bato. Yeah. Mr. Chair, narawin ko lang kay Chancellor Camacho. Sir, okay yung partnership ninyo, okay yung experience ninyo as far as ngayon nakikita mo, di ba? Pero titingnan natin kung ma-open up na ito. At remember, this is going to be business. Pag pumasok na sila dito, baka wala na kayong partnership, wala na kayong magiging partnership. Uh, engagement with them. They'll negotiate it. Pinapasok ninyo kami dito, amin na ito, bahala na kayo sa buhay ninyo, kami nang bahala dito. They'll, this is a negosyo. This is business. Uh, what, what do you think will happen sa, sa, like sa inyo kung masyado kayo nagre-rely sa partnership with them in order to to better your uh, your quality of education na uh, uh, inu-offer ngayon sa ating mga kababayan Ito lang, theory ko lang ito. Kung andito na sila, tapos, well, andito na kami. Amin na ito. Uh, bahala na kayo dyan. So, siguro tayo, mag-rely tayo on our own. Uh, Goberno natin, asahan natin na pagandahin natin to or maghanap ka ng ibang uh, partnership ng ibang hindi nakakapasok dito. 
Eh, ako lang, nag-iisip lang ako ng, ano, ng posibilidad. What do you think, sir? Sa tingin ko, sir, ay uh, uh, papasok po, mas, mas makakahikayat po, in, po tayo ng uh, uh, mas uh, maraming uh, quality higher education uh, investors to mga uh, foreign investors on uh, academic institutions and higher education. Uh, sa tingin ko, sir, kung uh, babaguhin po or ma-improve po natin natin mga sistema at uh, mga proseso. Uh, sa tingin ko, sir, uh, mas makakahikayat tayo dito kung ang mga uh, proseso sa procurement o mga proseso sa regulations natin ay uh, ma-harness or ma-improve po natin. Pero, sir, halimbawa po, uh, yun po sa Nagoya University, every time po na sila po ay uh, magdo-donate ng mga equipment or facilities nila dito sa sa amin, sa UPLB. Kailangan pong dumaan sa customs. Uh, pero dahil po mabusisi yung proseso ng pagpasok uh, ng mga highly, y- yung mga matata, yung mga, mga uh, high-tech na equipment po, ay kailangan po talaga nilang pagdaanan ng mga ganitong uh, proseso. So kailangan po siguro na mas uh, mapa daliho natin yung mga proseso para mas makahikayat pa po tayo ng mga uh, foreign investors on higher education. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, yung concern lang ako sa atin, yung sarili natin, but just in case makapasok sila dito, what will happen to ours? Yung atin talaga din, siguro, uh, mag-benefit tayo dyan in the sense na kung ano yung magiging produkto nila, baka pwede nating ipapasok sa ating sistema, then that will contribute, di ba? Assimilation or how do you call it? So, yun lang nakikita ko. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's Salamat, very, Sir. Uh, that's a good point Chancellor. by uh, Senator uh, De La Rosa. Yung baka nga, <laughs> mawala yung partnership kung sakali. I'm just curious, Chancellor, ito bang tatlong nabanggit yung universidad? Yung Nagoya, uh, Curtin, at saka Reading, are they private or state-owned uh, Uh, ang Nagoya uh, po, sir, ay uh, uh, public. Uh, public po yun. And then oh. ang uh, Reading din po ay uh, public. Okay. Ang uh, Curtin sa pagkakalam ko din po, sir, ay uh, uh, public din po. Ah, so they're all three are public? Yes, sir. Okay. So yung concern ni Senator Bato will apply to a privately owned, kasi yun, profit, uh, um, uh, run, uh, they're determined, they're their policies will be determined by their profit motive. Pero it's a good point, Vice uh, Thank you. Uh, siguro, let's let's switch over to, uh, let's have one more from the Research and Development Cluster. Uh, si Director De Lara of the OST Philippine High School, Science High School. And then we can go to the uh, some of our private sector uh, uh, resource persons, the PCCI and uh, uh, Dr. Kulaba, Tony Natura, among others. Um, so can we hear from uh, the DOST Philippine High Philippine Science High School System Deputy Executive Director Rod Delara? Is he here? Yes. Ah, yes, sir. Morning. Morning, Mr. Chair. With reference to the Senate resolution of both houses, number six, titled "A Resolution of Both House of Congress Proposing Amendments to Certain Economic Provisions." of the 987 Constitution of the Republic of the Philippines, particularly Articles number 12, 14, and 16, the PSHS system posed no objection at this point to the aforesaid constitutional amendment that will allow the entrant of foreign schools in the country to offer basic and or higher education services to Filipino and non-Filipinos residing or living in the Philippines. The PSHS system being the country's premier STEM high school, catering to Filipino scholars with high aptitude in science and mathematics, welcomes all government initiatives that will improve the standards of education in the country at all levels. Foreign or international schools operating in the Philippines have been part of our feeder system, time immemorial. During the 2023 PSHS National Competitive Examination, or the NCE, some 224 students from 62 locally-based international schools 
set for the NCE to vie for 1,920 available scholarship slots across the country, of which 95 of them scored above the national mean score, the minimum NCE score required to be considered as principal qualifier in a PSHS campus. For a better perspective, only 3,510 students out of 24,738 NCE applicants across the country scored above the national mean score. For international schools, this translates to a 47% qualifying rate, which is significantly higher than the national average of 14%. As for the entrance of international universities in the country, this would provide additional pathway for our graduates. In 2021, some 138 ESHS scholars qualified for admission to 258 undergraduate courses from 90 universities abroad, but only a little over 20% of them would pursue studies abroad due to high cost of living and studying abroad. Having international universities in the Philippines can offer alternative pathways for our scholars to earn international degrees at substantially lower cost. In view of the above, the PSHS system is receptive to the Joint House Resolution proposing to amend the constitution that will allow the entrance of foreign schools and universities in the country and reserves its comments until the ensuing law and implementing rules and regulations thereto is drafted. Thank you. Just to clarify, you're saying you're well, you were uh, uh, in favor of uh, entry into basic education at the high school level, secondary level? Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, can, can I just want to recap your stats? You're saying 14% versus for, for uh, 47% versus 47 47%. versus 14%. Okay, but that's a that's a that's a statement on our basic education, real, diba? You're saying it's it's of a lesser quality when it comes to, uh, what's that? Science and uh, what what other mathematics? Some of the mathematics, STEM, 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 STEM in general. Okay, okay, sige. Thank you. Uh, uh, as said, as mentioned earlier, uh, with the permission of my colleagues, we'll move to some of the private sector just to. Uh, have a different flavor. The PCCI is here. So we have the Vice President of the SATI or the Semiconductor and Electronics Industries in the Philippines, Chairman Ferdinand Terry Ferrier. Of course, uh, semiconductors are our main export, if I'm not mistaken. No? So please correct me, the DTI people, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so Perry Ferrier, uh, sir, please. Uh, yes, good, uh, good morning, uh, uh, Honorable Chairman and also to the senators. Uh, thank you for giving the Philippine Chamber of Commerce and Industry an opportunity to speak here, as well as SAPI, the Semiconductor Electronics Industries to the Philippines, which is the largest exporter. In 2023, we exported around 46 billion uh, exports. Uh, the Philippine Chamber of Commerce will support any constitutional amendments, but limited only to the economic provisions that will enhance the competitiveness of the Philippines and attract more local and foreign investors. And enhancing the ability of our country to participate in more effective, effectively in global trade. That is where PCCI will always be your supporter and also be your partner. Uh, when it comes to education, it's always been our advocacy to generate quality jobs. But quality jobs, but quality jobs needs quality workers, quality and capable workers, which all stem from the educational system. We have 3.4 million students. We graduate approximately 750,000 annually. This is the feeder stock or the feeder institution to continue the successful uh, on our businesses. Without these students, without quality education, without 
21st century skills in our educational system, in our graduates, our uh, businesses will continue to incur more cost in their own training. So we, we support any measures that if we can bring in international uh, partners into the country in providing 21st century skills into the country, into our 3.4 million students, this will ensure the continued trajectory of our businesses and growth in our businesses. So uh, when it comes to supporting international uh, partners, I believe uh, earlier it was mentioned, we believe international institutions, educational institutions will not just dive in and come in 100%. We believe uh, like any other business, they will look for local partners. We have several uh, private and SUCs, and I believe the foreign educational institutions will initially look for partners in the Philippines. From then, there will be technology or educational transfer, which in turn will flow down to our students and eventually businesses. Thank you, Chairman. Well, it's quite an, an enlightened uh, viewpoint from your point of view because some domestic uh, industries would not want the competition. But uh, so we, we thank you for that. Uh, but but with respect to your specific industry, and maybe perhaps you put on your hat as a, as a participant in the semiconductors, how how would uh, liberalizing higher education improve? Aside from providing quality graduates, uh, that assumes the entry of quality institutions also into our country. But uh, aside from that, what specifically, uh, what niche would the Philippines uh, be able to, or how uh, uh, can climb the ladder, so to speak? No? Uh, I just mentioned that because the Senate made an amendment in the DTI budget to uh, study the possibility of wafer manufacturing. I think we discussed that uh, when when we spoke at the PCCI at some point. No? So that, that's uh, under the Senate amended uh, the DTI budget to include a study on wafer manufacturing because we realize if we don't have the industries here, then the graduates will just leave. But maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, uh, where you want the industry to go if you had uh, uh, the ability to attract the uh, uh, quality institutions and to produce quality graduates, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, I will limit my discussion on education and training. Our semiconductor industry, uh, we all know that a lot of uh, investment has gone to our neighboring countries. Uh, and thank you for discussing the possibility of having a wafer fabrication uh, here in the Philippines, which is the missing element in the whole semiconductor supply chain. We have the design and development. We have assembly, test, and packaging. Only thing missing is the wafer fab. And that is, you can say that is the soul when it comes to semiconductors. Vietnam is investing heavily on wafer fab. India is now investing in wafer fab. And that's how it all starts in the wafer fabrication. Of course, prior to that this is the design and development, but uh, we all know about TSMC, who has TSMC now has two factories, uh, inaugurated one factory in, in Japan, in Kyushu, uh, now starting a second factory. TSMC now has a factory in Arizona. So, the reason I'm specifically talking about the semiconductor and electronics, it provides high quality, high paying jobs in the Philippines. At the same time, it creates downstream the supply chain. Now, uh, liberalizing, uh, bringing in uh, international training or educational uh, institutions in the Philippines, we have a gold mine in the Philippines, which is 3.4 million students, which is the envy of most countries, which they don't have that young population. So educating, not just educating, uh, developing, upskilling our students 
to the 21st, 22nd century skills, what the industry needs, will secure the Philippines. Will secure the Philippines, uh, Chairman, in its position to be a first world economy by 2050. That one we believe in the industry. We truly believe, but we need to upskill our workers and uh, our students, which we have now, 3.4 million. So uh, bringing in partners now, uh, there is always the discussion of jobs and skills mismatch. Actually, we just want to narrow it down. We don't want it to meet because the gap between the, the skills mismatch and the job, that's the innovation part. We want the industries to continue to innovate and let the educational system you know, just be not far behind. But during the pandemic, what we saw in the industry, our, the quality of our graduates deteriorated. It's because of the digital divide. You know, uh, here in Manila, you know, the, our, our the students was able to go online, go on online training, education. But what was alarming was the provincia who was not able to go online or learn. So there are many things to improving, but one is really connectivity. And I, I, I know uh, there are programs, open access bills, uh, improving the connectivity, inter con internet connectivity throughout uh, DepEd and the higher education. And that's one step of bringing our uh, students, our future leaders and business people to uh, higher uh, skilled and higher skilled workers. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate that. From uh, the National Academy of Science and Technology, we have Dr. President, Vice President and Academician of the National Academy of Science and Technology, Dr. Albert. Alvin sorry, Dr. Kulapa. I'm sorry. Yeah. Good morning, Mr. Chair and the Honorable uh, Senators. Uh, please allow me to share my screen here uh, for my uh, position. Uh, I would like to make it clear that uh, I've been invited here as a resource person, and my views does not necessarily shared by the National Academy of Science and Technology and of uh, De La Salle University. But uh, I'm an engineer, and I have over 30 years of uh, you know, uh, experience within the scientific and the academic uh, community. No, so the, just uh, uh, as an introduction, which uh, uh, area of research? Mechanical is your area energy. Of research? energy. Energy. Energy, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, amending the Article 14, Section 4 uh, uh, of the 1987 Constitution, uh, will this necessarily create wealth, you know, for, for the country? Next slide, please. I'm taking off from the, the last uh, public hearing where many of my colleagues uh, actually share their views though, on this uh, proposed amendment. If you look at this uh, particular uh, slide here, these are the stages of development and the competitiveness uh, drivers. Uh, there are three, uh, you know, in the uh, world uh, global competitiveness uh, ranking, they look at basic efficiency and innovation. But, uh, the Philippines is still situated in the transition between the factor-driven stage and the efficiency-driven stage. We are very far from the innovation-driven stage, where, in fact, in this current administration, we would like to pursue an industrial strategy which is driven by innovation. Next slide, please. In this particular slide shows the GII, the Global Innovation Index, this has been shown by some of my colleagues uh, last uh, public hearing. And I just want to reiterate, uh, you know, in the 2023 uh, data that the Philippines still, you know, far from even amongst the, the ASEAN from the point of view of uh, research and development score, 
and in terms of the researchers in full-time equivalent per million population, which is actually reported as 173.6. Okay, so we're a bit uh, far uh, from our neighbors here in, in the ASEAN. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. If we want to move up the value ladder to the innova uh, innovation stage, it is a lot of uh, you know, work no? from a physical resource-based uh, economy to labor intensive, moving up to the capital intensive economy and to the knowledge-based and technology-based economy. And, and up in the ladder, ladder is the innovation uh, uh, stage. So where is the Philippines here? We're still uh, hovering between a labor-intensive to a capital-intensive uh, uh, you know, uh, transition uh, economy. Next slide, please. Three, uh, Dr. Kulawa. Kasi yes. I'm sure maraming nanonood sa hearing natin yeah. ngayon. I think those are very technical terms, no? Maybe if we could take a pause and uh, explain lang natin sa masa. Paano tayo nag, ano yung ibig sabihin ng labor intensive? Ano yung, at ano yung mga ehemplo niyan, yung capital intensive? Ano yung, for example, what is a labor intensive uh, uh, product or innovation? And when when do you know? Uh, kailan mo malalaman na nandun ka na sa capital intensive? Okay. Oh, please, sorry. But most of our, I don't know, uh, karamihan ng industriya natin dito sa Pilipinas ay micro and small and medium enterprises. And therefore, uh, the technology that uh, are actually uh, utilized are still manual uh, and therefore would uh, use more people, uh, you know, to operate these uh, machines. And uh, yes, I think the DTI is here about what? So things like garments, siguro. Mga garments. garments mga yeah, the factories oh, that yeah, we have. Doesn't involve uh, uh, technology too much. No? Yeah. But if, even in higher, like even in semicon. Yeah, there is still a lot of uh, engineers needed there, uh, you know, to operate, uh, you know, the machines. In terms of capital intensive, uh, you know, uh, business, or, you know, these are, you know, the manufacturing uh, industry, uh, like the Semicon, for example, no? um, the, the uh, other industries, uh, you know, that uh, really make use of, of huge machines and uh, high-tech machines. So these are capital uh, intensive uh, Okay, uh, uh, activities. Okay, next slide, please. So the government has been uh, spending a lot, you know, in building science, technology, and, uh, you know, engineers. And this is a, an important investment. It is a business investment as we see that science is uh, a business for the people. Hence, there must be a return on investment. And uh, the return on investment here should actually transform to uh, economic growth and national competitiveness. Next slide, please. So our national investment in SDE has been on capacity building. Huge and massive funds are put into, you know, building our s and capacity through scholarships. For many, I'm, I, I'm a, uh, you know, a recipient of that. And of course, uh, also building our readiness uh, to do research and innovate. And uh, this is the core of our uh, STE uh, investment you know, in this country. But did this investment translated into the growth in our economy and competitiveness of our country? Next slide, please. Currently, the Philippine Science and Technology Human Capital has to be mobilized to the, the various strategies and roadmaps that our agencies of the government, like the Department of Science Technology, the Commission on Higher Education, the Department of Trade and Industry. But we are also guided by the Philippine Development Plan, 23, 2023 and 2028. There are some economic agenda there, which also includes science, technology, and innovation. And the National Academy of Science and Technology actually through the DOST, the Pagdanao 2050, which academician uh, Padolina mentioned in the last public hearing. Uh, next slide, please. So the s and Human Capital Development Framework would see that the ACATI Academy is at the core of our human capital uh, source. And it actually connects to, to the 
practically all sectors of the economy. It has, it's actually uh, the main uh, you know, producer of our SNT human capital. So we need to strengthen our academic uh, you know, institution as it can be seen in this uh, uh, diagram. Uh, next slide, please. The current state of our education based on the CHED 2023 data, there are over 2,000 uh, higher education institutions, which actually includes the various satellite campuses of SUCs. If we exclude these satellite campuses, it would still be around 1,975 higher education institutions. And uh, to think that there are only how many of the uh, institutions here have centers of excellence, as you can see on the upper uh, third quadrant of this uh, slide, centers of excellence and centers of development, mostly concentrated in the national capital region. And there are not many uh, you know, uh, science programs or STEM programs which are actually considered as centers of development or centers of uh, excellence. The data also shows that there are in the academic year 2016 to 2017, according to the CHED data, only a few or 28 out of this, you know, HEIs that we have offer PhD programs. It is understandable because the CHED requires that to be able to offer a PhD program, you need three full-time faculty in that particular area in general area. They are not even talking about very specific area in the, in the discipline. So the SNT situation in our HEIs is a bit alarming because if you look at the data on the lower end of this figure, the uh, in STEM enrollment is going down. Now, if we want to address our innovation uh, driven economy in the future, well, we have to rethink. How do we reverse this, this trend, okay? STEM graduates also are declining. So we need to uh, really, uh, you know, uh, look at that. And that particular figure there shows the different, you know, STEM areas. Okay, next slide, please. So this is the current scenario. I'm analyzing uh, currently, uh, you know, assessing the SNT human capital in the country. So at the moment, this is how it's, it's happening. The industry cannot move up uh, primarily because of the weaknesses of our SNT sector from our uh, academic you know, institutions. There are not many faculty with PhDs. Why are we talking here of PhDs? No? Because these are the people who are actually expected to generate new knowledge. Universities by definition, no? should generate new knowledge, apart, of course, from the uh, other uh, functions of teaching and the extension or community uh, service. In fact, in our uh, assessment, many of those who conduct research and development, about 42% have no PhDs. So what do you expect of the, the, the quality of ideas uh, you know, that will come out of those research you know, activities. So if you can see in this diagram, while the government provides the uh, regulations and the, uh, you know, incentives and other programs, scholarships, et cetera, to be able to support, you know, the, the graduate, the STEM graduates, so that it can supply the needed, uh, you know, manpower of industry, as uh, Mr. Ferreira mentioned, you know, earlier, there's still a lot of things to be done in the HEI. Our capacity in the HEI is not there. That's why it's tilted. There's a gap, that's the problem. Next slide, please. In our uh, s human capital, we, the government has identified seven priority areas from water, food and nutrition, health, sufficiency, clean energy, environment, infrastructure, and even technology. There are not many of our SNT uh, you know, personnel are competent enough 
you know, to, to actually contribute towards solving the problem of this, uh, you know, uh, particular, you know, sectors. Uh, next slide, please. So what do we need to do? I think it's a good idea to open up foreign HEIs in the country. This is what I probably call as a catch-up strategy. If we do the business as usual at the moment, our capacity to train our own uh, PhDs in this country is very, very low. We will not be able to do it. We will not be able to catch up with, you know, our population is growing at a fa much faster rate than at the rate we are actually producing our SNT, uh, you know, human capital. So in other words, uh, you know, so the, the foreign HEIs will actually accelerate the opportunity to, uh, to train and capacitate our uh, uh, SNT uh, human resource. And if that happens, you can see that, you know, it will be now more balanced, uh, you know, so we can put the industry up and hopefully, you know, uh, deliver, uh, you know, the, the wealth that is needed by, by this country. With your permission, uh, yes. Dr. Exactly. Pulaba, who are, who are the producers of the PhDs? Is it the state colleges or is it the private institutions? Both. Right now. Well, so when we say we are lagging behind, both the private and the public are lagging behind. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's a mandate of, you know, a higher education is, just, is a, as a trifocal function. So research is already, you know, but of course our core, core function is to teach. So if we need to strengthen our industry, then, and uh, sustain innovation, we need to have highly capable uh, s &T people. So, uh, uh, you know, because the, the objective there is to develop technology. We cannot just be a user of technology. We have to develop technology. And the development of technology and innovation arise from a strong research and development activities. But certainly there are many challenges uh, to this, which I have actually indicated in this chat, in this, you know. But on the right side, if you look at the, uh, the other post, no, there is this red, uh, you know, uh, space there which are actually the challenges that we need to address. I think it was actually mentioned already many times by our colleagues and resource persons today and the last public hearing. There are still uh, many restrictions if, we, uh, if a foreign institution would be, would be operating in the country and that has to be addressed as well. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this is hopefully, uh, you know, what will come out an innovation ecosystem. Uh, you know, an innovation ecosystem is actually uh, a diverse, uh, you know, uh, participants uh, from all, you know, sectors of, of the economy. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, hopefully with uh, a robust innovation ecosystem, we can now translate our investment in science, technology, and engineering to, uh, you know, uh, economic growth and national uh, competitiveness. And next slide. Currently, what's happening is many of our talents are going out. And do you want to continue this? Okay, so we have to take care and uh, capitalize on the, on the talents that we have, uh, you know, uh, in the country. Next slide, please. And uh, next slide, please. And finally, amending the Constitution on Article 4, personally, it's necessary to create wealth. My answer is yes. Thank you. I noticed that slide has the biggest font. Uh, yung <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kulaba. Uh, can we hear from, uh, since you brought up that whole academe thing, maybe we should also consult the people at UP and TUP. So Technological University of the Philippines, uh, Attorney Christopher Mortel. Attorney, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Uh, Presiding Chairman and the Honorable Members of the Committee, uh, fellow workers in the government, good morning. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in the interest of time, and it's, it has already been uh, discussed by several uh, resource persons, the Technological University of the Philippines 
uh, join the position of the Commissioner on Higher Education in supporting the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. But maybe you could share a little bit. Uh, what, what is the status now of TUP? Ano bang, what is your mandate when it comes to higher education and innovation? Uh, and how are you performing it? Or And uh, uh, how will uh, at, uh, opening up the education uh, to foreign-owned institutions improve our innovation ecosystem? Of course, nabanggit na rin ng iba. No? But, but from your standpoint, sir? Uh, from the university's standpoint, and to uh, bring context, the, basically the mandate of the university is to provide education, particularly in engineering and technology education. And bringing in a, a foreign institution or liberalizing the uh, uh, higher education institution in the Philippines will also support in the effort of the uh, government to, or in support of the internationalization effort of the university, as well as uh, with regard to upskilling the uh, faculty of the university, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, UP, can we hear from Dr. Menchit Padilla? Ma'am. Good morning to um, Mr. Chair and the members of the committee. I actually am here to represent uh, researchers and scientists, but allow me to just uh, say at the offset that uh, at the outset that any amendment that will help help research and development growth in the country is going to be welcome. But let me make this a couple of points. Well, number one, um, in the issue of um, um, internationalization, there are many ways. Uh, partnership is part of the life of UP. So I'm actually uh, a retired professor of the university and partnerships, we have survived just on the area of partnerships in the field of medicine, even before, even without, for, with formal informal engagements, we have collaborated with um, universities in the US, Europe, Asia, and without any of these universities wanting to have any investment in our university, but they want to partner in terms of production of new ideas. So maybe I will just limit it to the field of health. So if I may just bring in home a point that uh, um, there is another way of solving the issues at hand. Number one, in UP Manila, we have actually been able to push the issue of uh, new knowledge and productivity. But let me explain to you now that even if we were able to produce a lot of products, there is a gap in our system because we are not able to scale up our products and our researchers will have to bring it overseas and then bring it, bring it back to the Philippines at a higher cost. So if you're looking now at investment and business to the country, we actually have another formula. So maybe I'd like to share this now that, you know, as a, um, as a research university, we are expected to produce the products for the country to solve the problems. And we have identified another solution. So we have the products now. We'd like to set up a science and technology part to actually scale up our products that we have developed in the country. So that will bring in foreign investment because they will be locators who, we, who, who can actually bring in talent and expertise to help our students and at the same time keep them. So maybe I, I'll wear another hat at this point. I, I actually chair a committee that is setting up the science and technology, technology park for UP Manila at the new Clark City. What we realized during the COVID pandemic is that even if we produced a lot of products, there was no, uh, nothing in the country that can scale them up. And when we ran out of, um, of uh, you know, the parts, nobody would give them to the Philippines because they had their own problems. So with a very tight schedule at the moment, uh, UP Manila is setting up a science and technology park specifically for health so that we can uh, scale up at least 26 local products that we have on hand. And we have 13 biomedical devices that we can produce for our country. So that actually brings in um, uh, low cost uh, products and the biomedical devices for use of the health sector. 
Now, um, where does the government come in? Okay, because now we're working very hard. We're, well, we've been supported by the Department of Science and Technology for products for TRL. TRL is a technology readiness level from one to four. We are working with the DTI at the moment to help us scale, us, scale this up. And now we're working with government like Department of Health to buy to the product. So if you talk about what will bring the business to the country, it's not just foreign investment to the university, but actually helping the university produce the products and then scale them up. Now, I the ladder presented by academician uh, uh, Kulaba shows the labor intensive the and, and the innovation on the top of the ladder. You want to go up the ladder. So what I'm saying now is that the universities are actually producing innovations. But to be able to do that, we need support from government. We need foreign investment. So right now, as we build the science and technology park in New Clark City for the health sector, we are talking to foreign investors and local investors. It will bring in jobs. It will bring in the talent who can help in the universities. So in the spirit of internationalization, I just want to share the uh, with UP, of course, with Chancellor Camacho, that partnerships is one way of internationalization. But the liberalization that we are appealing for is to allow us to hire foreign faculty. Because in, the current, in our current state right now, we are not allowed to hire foreign faculty. They can only be lecturers. I think that can improve the, um, if we can do that, then I think it can bring more people here. So liberalization means not only bringing in investment to the university, but actually bringing in the talent and hiring them formally. This has been done by many countries in the region. And I know for a fact that um, many countries like Singapore, they brought in talent from abroad to be able to scale up uh, their capacity with an exit strategy of at least a decade. So in the spirit of um, investment, we urge the government to fund our local researchers. Um, the investment comes in many ways. Education is one, but to become a research university, you must be producing the products. So that will mean investment from government. If you want to scale up now for, for the products, then we appeal to government to support the science and technology park so that we create jobs in the Philippines, bring foreign talent, and at the same time, bring business. So at the moment, uh, in the development of the science and technology With your permission, park, uh, yes. I think you raised a very important point, the uh, hiring of foreign personnel because that's a different provision of the constitution and in that provision there is already a uh, proviso or an exemption uh, meaning I'll, if i may read this is uh, article 12 section 14 the second paragraph the practice of all professions in the philippines shall be limited to filipino citizens save in cases provided by law so i think mas swak yon dun sa provision na ito kaysa dun sa pinag-uusapan uh, sa resolution number 6 Tama ba yun, Dr. Padilla? Is that what's preventing you from... Uh, because there is no enabling law? Uh, yes, because in, in UP, I'll just speak for you. Well, we'll consult okay. uh, Attorney Natura and the other lawyers, Attorney Estrada, uh, Dr. Devera also on this. But but please, go ahead if you have we to. We can only hire them yeah. as uh, lecturers. We cannot hire them as professors. So if you want to get talent from another university... They and, do not and what is the difference? Could you just specify for those who are not... Uh, knowledgeable about the world of academe. What is the, yeah. If you wanted to hire a professor, then you bring them to come in with all the uh, the perks of the position. They become a regular faculty member of the university. And with so, research, with respect to research, what is the difference? Uh, well, we do have research professors now in the university. It's really the same. That's just one, one, uh, one position at the moment. They can be hired as uh, lecturers, that's one. Uh, they can be not at the level, because if we're talking about tertiary education of hiring additional talent, that will be the entry point wherein we will be allowed to hire a foreign faculty as part of a regular faculty. 
Uh, for the science and technology part, I don't think that will be an issue because the goal is to bring in uh, foreign talent uh, really from uh, local and international already at the moment. But for tertiary education, we will need a uh, the guidelines for that to allow us to hire them as regular faculty. Uh, yeah, okay, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll still give you time afterwards, but I just want to to this point, uh, Dr. Rivera, yes, you're raising your hand, and then I'll ask the two lawyers here. Yeah, uh, a quick intervention, Mr. Chair. I'd like to inform the committee that even if you uh, teach in a state university or college, dual citizenship is not allowed. The civil service requires that you have to give up your citizenship to be able to to uh, teach in uh, and be appointed in a state university or college. I, it's really interesting because we encourage them to come back here, but we don't allow them to that's teach. A, yeah, that's a very interesting, yeah. uh, no, no. Maybe, <laughs> I think we should consult the Civil Service uh, Commission on that policy. Is that a, a, it's a long-standing policy, uh, Dr. A uh, 2016 uh, circular mm -hmm. by the Memorandum Circular of the Civil Service Commission. Right. MC number right. 23, series of 2016. Yeah. So, yeah, I understand the spirit of this law, no? but maybe medyo baka maihuwag tayo dito sa ganitong klaseng uh, pag-iisip. No? So, like, can I get the thoughts of... Uh... You yes, know, sir. You know, Mrs. Chairman, what, what is the spirit? Kasi Filipino din yun. <laughs> yun nga. So I think the spirit, the spirit is to ensure allegiance only to one country. So, But that's that kind of thinking, I think, is product of a, a more uh, uh, outdated world or, or a different world. I had maybe not to prejudge it, but it's the product of a different world, uh, a world where, you know, nationality was very important and maybe we fought wars uh, uh, by firing guns, and which is still being done in Ukraine and other things. But, but of course, the world has changed in many respects, uh, Mr. President, and uh, um, there is a much benefit to be taken from uh, migration, for instance, as shown by, you know, when... Einstein migrated to the U.S., among other things. And, you know, there was a lot of uh, knowledge sharing there. Uh, just, just to give an example, no? So, yes, so, yes, go ahead. Go ahead so just to emphasize that uh, a Filipino who is a dual citizen is, from the point of view of Philippine law, a full Filipino. Tandaan natin yun, talaga full Filipino. I think yun ang sinasabi nga ni Dr. Vera. Bakit natin pinayagang maging Filipino? And yet, parang hindi natin binigay ng buo sa kanya, di ba? Binigay natin sa kanya, pero for what? Diba? For maybe maybe so he can own land, he can do other things. But but di na natin binuo na it, it works to our detriment pa. Diba? Yun, I think that's Tapos, his point. Pero pa, Tama tayong, ba? pero pa tayong palik scientist program na most likely, kunyari, naka 10 to 20 years na sa ibang bansa yun, baka dual citizen na bumalik siya rito, tapos ano, di, di siya pwede magturo. That's yeah, it. Very good uh, example. Uh, in fact, in fact uh, yes, I'll, I'll recognize Senator De La Rosa you, after you, Senator Pinin. Hindi siya pwede magturo. Yeah. He cannot be appointed to a plantilla position in oh, state. He will be required to give up his other citizenship. That's yeah. the rule of the Civil Service Commission. Uh, hindi naman kasal yan, eh, di ba? Parang, <laughs> hindi, naman pwedeng, hindi naman pwedeng dapat isa lang, di ba? I think in the world of academia, are we in agreement that, uh, in fact, these multiple connections or engagements are beneficial rather than detrimental? Tama ho ba? Ayun. So, so that's established, no? So then we'll ask... Uh, uh, attorney Natura and Attorney Estrada on their views on this. Uh, and and but, uh, that, that uh, mas, maganda, maganda na nabanggit yan. Because these are the implementing laws of our constitutional provisions that can actually defeat the intent or maybe improve the intent of the Constitution as the case may be. Attorney Natura, yes. Uh, good morning. Morning, uh, Mr. Chair. Morning, uh, Honorable Senators. Uh, again, uh, thank you for uh, the invitation to... Uh, give my personal insights on on uh, the proceedings now no? on specifically on the uh, matter at hand on the revision of a uh, paragraph uh, 2 of section 4 of our article 14 okay. um again i have to make a disclaimer i'm appearing here as a you know uh, just to give my personal insights I'm, I'm not appearing here on on behalf of the firm okay um okay um just to make it quick uh you know uh we I saw that based on the resolution of both houses, the the proposed proposed revision of a uh, of uh, section four, um, the insertion of the word basic uh, in educational institutions. I understand from the honourable chair that uh, the intention really is to limit. Uh, it, intention is not to open uh, uh, basic educational institutions to foreign ownership. 
So uh, in which case the, the the flip side of it, I think, is the I mean to, the intention is really to open up the higher educational institutions to foreign ownership. Uh, so with that, um, I, I I guess there is just need a need to clarify also. Uh, what would be the scope of uh, the uh, residual power of Congress in the second sentence in in uh, in requiring the increase of Filipino equity ownership? Because as, as of this point, at least from the draft, the uh, power is uh, still to be exercised in uh, on all educational institutions. Same with the third provision, same with the third sentence where the uh, uh, phrase unless otherwise provided by law was inserted. Um, Again, um, there may also be a need just to clarify the scope of the power of Congress in uh, ensuring uh, at what or to what particular institutions or educational institutions that control and administration should be reserved to uh, Filipino citizens. Okay. Um, uh, I guess uh, this, is, this, is, this is also a good opportunity to also consider the other uh, related provisions in the constitution that may have an effect, that may be affected by the revision of uh, uh, the amendment of uh, uh, section four. Um, um, in particular, uh, I, we, we note that uh, at least from the text of the resolution, um, the uh, third paragraph of the original uh, section four was no longer included insofar as um, um, the limitation on the uh, alien students. So, um, uh, if if uh, the intention really is to, uh, if if again the, we must also clarify whether the intention really is to remove the entirety of the provision, or to retain it and with certain modifications also that may be consistent already with the proposals. Um, another uh, uh, another other provisions that may also need to be examined will be. Uh, section three uh, of the same article, insofar as the uh, requirement of the constitution to teach uh, the, con the Philippine constitution in, by, uh, in all, uh, all educational institutions, as well as the paragraph two, which uh, uh, Im imposes the duty on uh, these educational institutions to, uh, to, uh, to instill patriotism, the value of uh, nationalism, foster love. So uh, those, I think, may also need to be uh, examined as and when uh, um, um, the uh, provisions are are being implemented are are to be, you know, are, are to be further discussed. And um, in relation to that, uh, since this is also a duty being imposed on the uh, at, at least for uh, paragraph two, section three, is also a duty being imposed on uh, educational institutions. Uh, I think there's uh, at least there is also a need to consider also what is the uh, uh, constitutionally recognized academic freedom of higher educational institutions on, on, on the possibility of Congress or the law implementing or imposing duties on these educational institutions on what can be covered or what should be in, in included uh, as part of their duties. Okay. Um, having said uh, uh, those points. Um, um, based on what I've heard uh, this morning, as well as what from what I've read, uh, based on the discussions uh, during the first hearing, I do believe that uh, again um, this uh, is an opportune time to get a you know to, to get a to to find the right balance to find the right balance on um, you know uh, trying to uh, ensure. That the Filipino interests and the Filipino values are 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 are, are um, instilled continuously to be instilled in the uh, in uh, our students and of course to achieve what I see as the uh, laudable objective of uh, trying to uh, open up uh, educational institutions, which as in the whereas clause of the resolutions to uh, uh, give uh, uh, access to the best educational institutions of both foreign and uh, Filipino students. Thank you, Attorney Thank you. Before I go to Attorney Estrada, I, I apologize to Senator Bato because I, I promised to recognize him earlier. He was going to make a point. Okay. Mas, I hope you did not lose your train of thought, sir. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, palang, comment ko lang doon sa sinabi ni Chairman Popoy Dibera kanina, yung dual citizens na 
cannot uh, ex- cannot uh, cannot uh, practice their prov- profession here in the Philippines. Para rin yung si Justin Brownlee ba? Binigyan natin ng ginawa nating naturalized citizen. Tapos hindi pa rin makapaglaro sa PPA as a, as a Filipino. Batas ang import. Parang ganun pa rin yun. Mga, mga, ano, mga kuwan sa batas ba? Mga unfair ni sa batas. <laughs> yun lang Mr. Chair. Mr. Chairman, no, no. in the case of yeah. uh, Justin Brownlee, dito po sa interpolations dito, klinaro natin yun. Kasi precisely yun ang dala natin point of view. Eh. Once you are uh, declared a Filipino, naturalized as a Filipino, you should be treated like a Filipino. Yun na sabi na, nag-warning pa nga tayo rito na if he's not treated like a Filipino, baka yung mga anti-discrimination laws meron pang na, nababiolate doon. Yeah, I think we, we made that very clear here. But in, of course, it, it really now depends on the uh, aggrieved uh, or the affected person if he wants to assert his rights so, so pero yan po ang ating interpretation po dito sa dito po sa Senado when we when we granted the the citizenship and Mr. Chair I even ask him pag magkagira tayo sa China are you willing to fight with the uh, Philippine army are you willing to fight uh, under the Philippine flag umuuso siya di ba so unfair naman magkipagbarilan siya sa mga kalaban ng uh, kalaban ng estado tapos hindi natin siya papalaruin as a Pilipino doon sa PBA. <laughs> Yun lang. That's beside the point, Mr. Bra- Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you for the That's analogy. The point. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Senator De Rosa and uh, Senator Pimentel. Uh, tama. Uh, Ba't ni na lang natin ibu. Uh, but first, may, siguro may we can ask them to explain the policy and uh, how it can be improved uh, or made more favorable to the state and the people. Attorney Strada, yes. Uh, thank you po, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Just very quickly lang po on that point raised by Senator De La Rosa and, and Chairman Popoy. I just want to update on behalf of the EDCOM that uh, that was raised, yung uh, pung, uh, RA 9225, on the restriction on those uh, appointed officials uh, the, of uh, holding dual citizenship. They have to renounce their uh, their foreign uh, oath to, to another country and they should take oath and allegiance to, to the Philippines. That is a general provision to apply to all government employees. Yes, sir. So maybe we should make an exemption, exemption. for uh, scientific research and, uh, and state universities. That, that, kind of, uh, that kind of thing, diba? And di naman for all positions, diba? Kasi yeah. okay. yung, uh, you might be depriving the Filipino of a... Of a of a job. But a Filipino na siya, actually. No? Yeah, so, so, yeah, you have to think of it. Uh, yeah, I, I, I shouldn't say that. Uh, but but it applies. It's a government prohibition that hindi nila naisip na uh, madedehado tayo in, re- in respect to science and technology. Tama ho ba? Yeah, yes, uh, yes oh, Mr. Okay. Chair. In fact, yung pong, uh, faculty of state universities and colleges covered by that restriction and also appointed officials to state universities and colleges. So we're thinking of removing that. We will be presenting that in our next commission meeting. Um now I'd like to I'd like to proceed lang Mr. Chair on my comments. It's following your following your direction in the last um, hearing that if we want to internationalize and liberalize education, we do not stop in increasing the foreign equity investment. There's a menu of reforms that need uh, to be done and uh, we don't stop there whether it's uh, increasing wealth, whether it's uh, uh, making our education institutions more capable or improving quality. Um, we we need to do a lot of things and we don't stop in increasing the foreign equity investment. Now on that point, uh, Mr. Chair, I just would like to clarify that um, in um, in allowing or liberalizing uh, education institutions in the country, there are two important aspects. Uh, number one is the establishment itself, which concerns the ownership, uh, the incorporation of the entity here, establishing a juridical personality here. And the second aspect is the recognition of that school. Yung pong second aspect, dito po yung, uh, dito to po yung uh, regulatory uh, environment applying uh, recognition from the Commission on Higher Education. Um, lahat po ng restrictions and na eh. So yung uh, increasing the foreign uh, equity investment or participation, it only concerns yung establishment. That's why we're saying yung pong lahat po ng... Uh, Iniisip natin whether it's a restriction or liberalizing, dun po mangyayari dun sa second aspect which is uh, the regulatory framework. And uh, in EDCOM, we have identified some of the administrative or regulatory barriers to liberalization that should also be addressed if we want to liberalize. So it's not only increasing the, the foreign equity participation, but actually making the policy environment more friendly. As uh, discussed uh, earlier, like yung pong hiring ng faculty, no? 
I just wanted to share that for even as it is now, if we want to invite foreign faculty, it has to pass through many uh, regulations, not only from CHED, it has to go through PRC, not only immigration. Like, for example, kung allowed na po siya ng uh, CHED, not based on the program, but the foreign faculty need to get clearance from the PRC because uh, that uh, faculty should come from a country where there is reciprocity, for example. So kung inalaw na po doon at pinagbawal ng PRC, hindi rin po yan papayagan ng immigration. No? Also for students. So lahat po yun. Um, we Checklist be... so we can ano, yes, give us yes, a checklist. Okay. But that's beyond really the jurisdiction of this committee. Yes. So I appreciate your mentioning it because there are four senators yes. here. Pero maybe we can breeze through that and then yes, focus on the constitutional amendment. Oh. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So yeah, we, we submitted po a, a, a presentation last time. So... Uh, we'll just uh, we'll, we will answer questions based on the presentation. Thank Thanks. you. So, Thank you. Yeah, because I think that's another that's for another forum, and uh, definitely we want to act on that. And uh, si Chairman uh, Win, si Minority Leader, who's also part of uh, Edcom. So. Thank you. Can we hear from Government Academy Industry Network Gain Executive Director Dr. Uh, Genevieve Ledesma Laurel, and then after that we'll hear from Iri, uh, DTI Tiesa, PI. Uh, Dr. Albert, PIDS. Maybe after Dr. Laurel, Dr. Albert can uh, can speak also. So, Dr. Laurel, you have the floor, ma'am. Yeah. Good morning, honorable chairman and members of the Senate and uh, distinguished guests and my fellow resource persons today. I'm representing uh, Dr. Peter Laurel, uh, chairman of uh, LPU, uh, Lyceum of the Philippines University, chairman of Government Academe Industry Network, and also chairman of the Association of Universities and uh, Colleges in the Pacific. Um, I'd like to, I, I hope that there will be spousal uh, transfer of knowledge uh, during this, this session. Um, I would like to uh, acknowledge our uh, Senator Gachalian. We've had sessions with you. Um, recommending our advocacy for national targets for English, science, and math, just like the other Asian countries. And it's very easy to check if they are uh, within global standards because it has been set with the government. I also would like to acknowledge uh, Senator Pimentel, who has been our guest in several uh, 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 events of the school. And likewise, um, Senator De La Rosa, we have a kinship. We come from the same region. And uh, Senator Angara, we've had sessions with you on how to improve our PISA scores uh, using free resources in the net. So thank you very much. But I'm here today to express my position of keeping the current constitution intact, emphasizing the importance of local control over all educational institutions while maintaining global connections without altering the constitution. Let me just uh, share with you that I am coming from uh, Southfield Global Education Network, likewise, a, a network of uh, eight private schools, and I have been approached many times by foreign investors to buy in and get control of the school. Uh, uh, they have uh, floated, actually, price earning of six uh, PE, six, up to PE8, and sometimes when you are uh, when you are given a figure of a billion, you think twice. You think twice, but in all of those offers, I knew that there were perils if ever I sign up and make a foreign uh, foreign group own a particular school. I part I look at the curriculum, and uh, of one of these supposedly partners. And I checked that for every semester, there was indoctrination of uh, ideologies that are not consistent with the democratic principles that we hold dear. And likewise, uh, maybe it will, it will uh, enlighten also the, our, our group that the experience of many of these foreign investors is when they make money, they sell it again, and then you have new investors coming in. Um, there is one person right now uh, today 
who is here, and he has told me about the horrendous experiences of foreign investors just looking at it as a business. And when they make their money and sometimes they leave the institution with millions of debts, hundreds of millions of debts, and they make the institution right now pay for it and they exit. Um, I, um, there is this one person who used to work for this group who is here right now, living tomorrow, and he will tell you the horrendous experiences of this aggressive foreign bodies that want to buy education. Who is that one person? Um, if we could uh, end the mystery. yeah. Uh, he is uh, uh, a foreigner, but I cannot, I can tell you in private. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, because, right. because it was, he told me in confidence what they do and how they damage the schools after leaving and uh, getting I'm the just curious, why would they damage it if their goal is to sell it? Then it's no longer sellable I mean, or it's no longer... they sell it. After, after they, they sell it, it. Ah, okay. That's they a different story. Loans, yeah. Hundreds of millions of loans. Right, right. And then they exit. Okay. Yeah. And actually, without us knowing, there are already uh, transactions like this going on. It's just not under the radar as of now. But my experience has been, and it's a personal experience, I've talked to many, and they have layered the ownership. And one of them who left this group told me that it, the money comes from the Middle East. Yeah. Uh, so just, just a personal sharing of an experience that I have. But anyway, I'm here to, uh, today to highlight the current successes in internationalizing education. And we are advocating for international education and show how Filipinos can access global opportunities without jeopardizing local control. I think our issue right now is not really whether we welcome foreign, uh, foreign universities and colleges. Our issue is ownership. And that's what I'm saying. There's a peril to this aggressive uh, foreign investors that will leave you dry after they exit and they sell. And uh, there are many financial transactions that happen. And uh, I'm happy that I did not sell my soul. Yeah, looking, looking back, especially having talked to this person yesterday who was a peddler of these aggressive organizations. But let me tell you that even those that are prestigious schools in the end, prestigious universities abroad. In the end, it's still, they ask you, is it worth our time and our effort? And let me tell you, because uh, right now, uh, actually internationalization is here. Uh, there are no barriers obtaining foreign education credentials at this point. Uh, the, the TNE of uh, CHED, facilitates transnational education partnerships, allowing foreign schools to offer specific programs in collaboration with existing Filipino institutions without compromising ownership and control over the core educational principles and convictions. Let me tell you three, three ways wherein we have allowed international universities to coexist with institutions in the Philippines now. The first one is what you call twinning programs. I wish we had the, uh, we had the slides because I don't want to go through all of the schools with twinning programs. AAM, for example, offers a global MBA program with dual credentials where students can earn an MBA degree from AIM and also from University of Western Australia. Then you have Thames International. They also have a two plus two with some some um, universities abroad. You have Mapua, who offers twinning programs with universities in Australia, Canada, and the United States. And we have Southville International School affiliated with foreign universities that offer Pearson and Southern Cross University. And other partners like uh, uh, bachelor's degree for other from Macquarie University. Then the second type of collaboration is called partnerships. You have the Lyceum of the Philippines University. Uh, they foster international connections through partnerships with many, many universities worldwide, including student and faculty exchanges, collaborative research, internships short term to a semester academic and cultural programs, um, partner universities across the world, Asia, Europe, and Canada. 
Then we have Southville International School affiliated with foreign universities. By the way, CISFU, we call it CISFU, has been in existence for 28 years. And it's the only transnational education that offers basic education up to master's degree program with a partner school abroad internationally. So you'll be surprised. What is CISFU, sorry? Uh, uh, Southville International School South. affiliated with foreign universities. He said it has been in existence for 28 years and we offer transnational education from basic ed to master's degree programs, but we retain control of the curriculum and we only allow these partnerships after having gone through what it is that they will teach our students. You have UST likewise, a long history of international uh, linkages and partnerships. You have Silliman University with a lot of uh, network and academic partnerships across uh, continents. The third, so first is the twinning, wherein they earn a degree from two schools, Philippines and another university abroad. The second is the partnership. It's more loose, it's student exchange, it's research collaboration, it is uh, training of faculty, so forth and so on. Uh, student, uh, student experiences, student camping. The third one is the more difficult one to do, which Southville is doing. It is franchising. We are franchising. Uh, we have franchised with actually two providers, Pearson UK and De Montfort University of UK. Um, franchising, actually, I was just given the definition of franchising by our president and chairman of SFU. Um, it is uh, a foreign academic partners agree with the host university in the Philippines to deliver the foreign degree curriculum in the Philippines. The teaching methodology and academic standards are closely monitored by the foreign partners. So let me just tell you more or less how much. And even if they come from a very, they're number one in terms of student experience, the Montfort University, but we have very, very few students. We have only about 200, even if we have been existing for a long time. Let me tell you why. Uh, registration fee is about uh, 75,000 pesos per year or per semester. And uh, uh, program fee is 10,000 uh, pounds or 560,000. And um, Annual fee per student, 750, 53,000. Collaboration review is 20,000 and uh, 20,000 pounds. And every year they come to audit because remember the grades come from them. The content of the curriculum comes from them. And the final, uh, they have, a, they call it a Senate in, in UK. It goes through several, several bodies before the grade is given. So we can do an internal grading here, but it is not final. It's only when, when it comes back and they get the degree from De Montfort. They can even graduate physically from De Montfort University. But it's very, the real universities which have good intentions are expensive. And uh, how, does it, how does this franchising help? Instead of our students going abroad, they pay here, and so therefore, uh, it helps in the economics of the country. So, so these are the three ways that are being practiced right now. And, and we have this model for the last 28 years and it's working. However, because uh, these students are bright, first of all, because UK, UK programs are very, very extensive in terms of critical thinking, but they have the money likewise. There are scholarships going on, but they are, they are limited. So uh, let me talk to you about the MOOCs or the MOOCs. These are massive open line courses. These are offered by Harvard, by Coursera, by Yale, and these are available, available to every Filipino. You can even, put them on the line and have 500 students listen to a Harvard lecturer without having to, without having to spend anything, their fees, so forth and so on. Bachelor's, master's and doctorate degree programs can also be obtained 
by any Filipino. Uh, I have a list. I have a list of those uh, uh, popular universities that are offering this. And uh, in the end, I would say that the, the focus the focus should be from my experience, the balancing of international education with our national identity. Controlling school ownership helps regulate curriculum content, uh, ensuring it aligns with our national values and democratic principles. I'd like to say that the thing that made me really not accept these proposals is the, is the threat of losing our freedoms and our democracy because the ideologies are not consistent with ours and it's every semester and there is no way we can monitor what's going on in the classroom eight hours a day allowing foreign ownership may pose a risk of, introdu of introducing ideologies inconsistent with our ethos potentially impacting our commitment to our democratic ideals and freedoms secured by our heroes and our constitution while the Philippines seeks to engage in international educational collaborations to enhance its educational system, and uh, I think Dr. Colabo uh, late, earlier was saying innovation, it's unique, ge our unique geopolitical situation necessitates a delicate balancing act. Full foreign ownership of schools raises concerns about the potential erosion of our national identity and cultural heritage. Filipinos must maintain authority to shape educational curricula that reflect our values and traditions. It is essential to safeguard what makes us Filipino and ensure that our educational system reflects our core values of governance anchored on our freedoms. In conclusion, in the intricate tapestry of global education, the Philippines' distinct geopolitical position necessitates a strategic approach, one that harmonizes international collaboration with the preservation of our unique identity and democratic values. These approaches, guided by a commitment to national autonomy, empower Filipinos to embrace global educational experiences without relinquishing control over our educational institutions. As we tread this path, it becomes evident that constitutional amendments are not requisite for safeguarding our democracy, Filipino values, national identity, and cultural heritage. Let our educational landscape be a testament to the harmonious coexistence of global connections and national authenticity. By upholding the current constitution and embracing international collaborations within a controlled framework, we illuminate a path towards a future where the Philippines thrives on the global stage while remaining steadfast in its commitment to democratic ideals, Filipino values, national pride, and cultural wealth and heritage. Um, as a representative of GAIN, Government Academic Industry Network, our advocacy is to develop our Filipino talent so that they can be globally competitive. However, these technology skills and other competency requirements are accessible to the Filipino without full Filipino ownership, without relinquishing full control of two non-Filipinos. We have millions of overseas Filipino workers who are grappling with national identity. Let us safeguard and let us ensure that our democratic ideals and cultural heritage are preserved. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just noticed uh, we're going on two hours, so maybe if we could take a five to ten minute health break uh, with the permission of my colleagues, then we can resume at uh, 12.05, if that's all right. Uh, that's 12.05, uh, 12.07, around that time. Thank you. Uh, well, hearing is suspended.
ladies and gentlemen. Uh, can we, I think, I'm not sure if Dr. Padilla was finished already. Would you like to continue, ma'am? And then after Dr. Padilla, Dr. Albert uh, from PIDS. Uh, yes, go ahead, Dr. Padilla. It's really very short. I just want to uh, ask, uh, request that the reframing of the economic policy does not contradict our... Sorry, sorry I'd just like to acknowledge our uh, Deputy Minority Leader, uh, Senator Risa Ontiveros, the Chair of the Senate Committee on Women. Morning. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon, yeah. Chair. Salamat po. Yeah, go ahead, Doctor. po ulitin ko lang po as just as to close my uh, my statements earlier, we just want to us to appeal to the committee that the reframing of the economic policy will not or will not uh, contradict the first Filipino and the Tatak Pinoy. I'm confident that will be the case, but I just want to put it on record. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, we'll to... not allow that because we're the okay. author of the Tatak Pinoy. Thank you. So Thank you. Definitely will not undermine our own work, uh, Chancellor. In fact, it's meant to be complementary to see how uh, we can benefit from these collaborations uh, rather than uh, lose our people, things like that. No. So thank you. Uh, can we hear from Dr. Albert and after that, Attorney Perez and uh, DTI, Tiesa, PI, uh, uh, we have Dr. Uh, previous guests also here. Dr. Sikat, uh, we'd like to acknowledge his presence, sir. Uh, anytime, sir, if you want to chime in, please, uh, you're most welcome. And from PACO also, TRC, TESA, and DTI-BOI uh, to complete the uh, guests. So, yes, Dr. Albert, please, you have the floor, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first, let me... Uh, point out that we all, uh, we provided already a position paper uh, as requested by the Secretariat. Uh, but as I speak now, I'd like to mention that the usual disclaimer that what I say are my own views and do, do not necessarily reflect those of the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Um, first, let me point out that um, as far as, you know, my, as far as I'm concerned, you know, the, the issue of change, uh, every time I'm always asked, I'm, all, I'm a very, I, I, I take things with a view of data, uh, being a statistician by profession, uh, though I write, I, I do a lot of policy research, but let me point out that as far as policy changes are concerned, I always say that change always uh, presents significant opportunities, but they also uh, provide potential risks that could impact uh, the nation's immediate as well as long-term future. And um, in this case, where the chair has already been pointing out that the though I, when I was reading actually the language of of the current uh, proposed amendments, I was actually confused because I thought. You know, the inter, the the this would be the scope would be much bigger than just uh, higher education. But maybe I'm wrong because I I'm not a lawyer. Uh, my father was a lawyer, and my uh, but uh, but I'm not one. I'm a, a statistician by profession, as I mentioned, and I only see data. And anyways, um, I in in the case of the education sector, we in fact we released just. Uh, last year, and we pub we made a public webinar about the a case on on the entire education sector being really broken. Uh, there are many problems we face. Uh, it's sad to say that the the point being raised earlier by Dr. Kulaba that uh, that we are we are very far from the frontiers of innovation. We the our labor market, our labor. Um, uh market is fairly unskilled and so the question is whether the proposed amendments will really help upskill uh that's the main point and we while we 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 um we load the efforts of our senators our legislators for trying to think of ways to to try to um solve <laughs> all our problems, but we, at the same time, we also need to take a step back and recognize that the solution to one problem may carry the seed of the next problem. Um, and that's a wisdom that I've learned myself, uh, you know, looking through the history of changes. And um, 
as was pointed out, I think by doc, both Dr. Padilla and already uh, Chairman De Vera, that the the issue of the of the barriers to entrance in higher education does not stop in in ownership alone, but they sadly go into so many other things, including the faculty appointments, which are which are a bit uh, worrisome, given that uh, when we think of trying to, as I said, upskill while they're, as was already pointed out by my next door neighbor here, who uh, she pointed out that there are already many things happening in the in the higher education sector. And so the question is whether whether or not uh, um, the, the, you know, full liberalization will 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 solve more prob will will solve problems or create new ones. Um, it's not easy for us right now because our crystal ball will never really fully show us where things will be. But nonetheless, I I would always say that uh, you know all this all changes are always welcome. But uh, at the same time, I caution the Congress to also recognize that there will be unintended consequences to whatever changes that we propose. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so you're just saying it's a, it's potentially rewarding, but also potentially risky. Uh, any position? <laughs> because I remember uh, that saying that, uh, I think it's President Truman or Eisenhower who wanted a one-handed economist. <laughs> Well, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not like an, an economist. Uh, we we do have the the father of economics here in the Philippines. Uh, but, uh, so so basically, in your in your uh, just to cut things short, uh, cut to the chase, uh, Doctor Albert, you you don't feel that uh, constitutional amendments uh, in the education sector are necessary. Uh, well, I think they are. Uh, you think they are? Okay. I think the it would be important not just in the education sector across. The, I mean, the, the Constitution for me was written at a time when we needed to strengthen ourselves okay. in certain ways. Okay. But but that said, yeah. please be careful. Okay. okay, got it, got it. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Sikat, uh, you're, you're, yeah, you're, you're free to, in, in, uh, to intervene, sir. Because uh, you spoke earlier on the general uh, uh, provisions on the economy and foreign investment, but we welcome your particular insights on this sector. Uh, um, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. In fact, I, I was uh, not sure you really wanted me today because... Uh, Apologies, sir. <laughs> the, as a matter of procedure, we just go to those who had that spoken first, but uh, uh, it took us uh, a while to get to you, but uh, by all means, we're listening, sir. Yes, but I was surprised. I was I was asked to come for today, and uh, I, I know the topic is, uh, is uh, education. Uh, <clears throat> I'm very happy to to speak on this topic to some extent because I'm an educator. But I also want to say a few things that might be uh, related to the constitutional issues that we are facing. Uh, I have looked at uh, a lot of constitutions of different countries and uh, especially the ones that uh, have uh, the, that have been cited uh, in our region and the advances uh, in the educational front. And I noticed, for one, that although education is oftentimes mentioned in, these, uh, uh, in their constitutions as a responsibility or the right of citizens, it is not at all a subject of uh, st strictures within the constitution. This is really strange that we're, do we're doing it here in our country. This is, the, this is my first point, because uh, the education, uh, educational policies, the running of uh, education is a matter for general legislation, a matter for ordinary legislation in most of these countries. It does not really require a quarreling of, uh, among, uh, among the principles of a country about the fundamental nature of education as a problem of, uh, of uh, great uh, concern. It is a great concern because 
we educate our people to improve them. But it is a matter for general uh, legislation. That's the main point. So to some extent, uh, I can say I am, uh, this explains why to some extent I say, I truly believe that we should be off the, the fundamental nature of discussing education as if it is something like an iron law to be followed uh, in which there are specific areas where we have to be bounded by principles. The only principle related to education is that it teaches us nationhood, nation building, love of country and so on. And that is the role of the, the government in running the educational sector for our children. Now the topic mainly I think today is that of, uh, of uh, higher education because this was really designed to look into the effects of the, of the restrictions on the constitution on the way we have run our educational system at the tertiary level. I'm glad I listened here today because I heard a lot of things that taught me a number of things, including those things I knew when I was at the UP. When I was at the UP, a lot of things about the difficulties of getting foreigners appointed within the faculty is one of the major item of discussion. And uh, it's amazing that it came as a result of a by the by comment of uh, Dr. Padilla that uh, that uh, the appointment of people of high quality will require a great burden because of the unintended consequences of the major provisions of our constitution, which has prevented us from getting the best education. Uh, this is the main point. I think uh, overall, it, it's very easy to see that greater freedom in educational programs, domestically promoted, and even promoted for, for foreign education of all Filipinos will help us in uh, upgrading our human skills. But uh, now that we're talking about the, the, uh, the liberalization of the restrictions that we have on education, I believe that all the things that we want, like uh, greater innovations in our country, improvement of the scientific skills of our country, countrymen, uh, the, the improvement of competition among the institutions doing teaching, the teaching of our youth, the Create the creation of a broader choice for education among parents for their children and the total upskilling of our labor force uh, are critical to the liberalization of education in the country. I look backward. I think uh, I, I might be permitted to look backward because I think it's, it's important for us to to understand the, uh, the nature of our backwardness in this area. I call it backwardness because I feel that in the last uh, 20 years, I mean, not 20 years, maybe 40 years, we have, we have uh, lagged slowly behind those countries in the region that had much greater freedom in the educational sector to take advantage of the innovations, the liberality of access to good educational institutions, the, liberal, the liberality of access given by foreign uh, institutions to help us get more resources to get education for the people. Uh, about 40 years ago, I think, or maybe 50 years ago, the UP or the Philippines, uh, the Philippine educational system was looked up to as a model within Asia. I think we were far ahead because we were partly 
benefited by the access to foreign to to American dollars, eight dollars to bring up our country. And then some institutions in the UP, for instance, they became much better off because China had a revolution and the revolution freed a lot of money from the Rockefeller Foundation, Ford Foundation, and it went partly to the Philippines and so on. I think I probably am a recipient of one of those kinds of things. A, a poor guy who got to be, uh, got a scholarship because of, uh, the, because there was dollar money available. And I, I think it's, uh, it helped us a lot. Uh, I, I, I'm not talking of myself, I'm talking of the university itself. The UP became a major institution bringing forward the country, I think, and the other institutions, the private institutions, they were following, but the UP was far ahead. Los Banos was far ahead. And with all the other kinds of uh, programs that, uh, that supplemented the, the gains that the UP had uh, in bringing itself up, it was able to become a, a force within the Asian, within the Southeast Asian region. We educated the Thais, we educated the Malaysians, we educated the Indonesians and so on. Today, I think we are far behind them in the educational sector. What, what brought us to that level? I think I, now I, I go back again to my old story. We got restricted and the restrictions are in the constitution and they were there. In 1935, it brought, uh, we didn't know them and we imported them into, the 19, into our 1987 revolution and added more because we suspected that some of these uh, some of the restrictions had to be more restricted in some areas. And we're, we're, we're in a, we, we are in a time when we discover that we have to reform a lot of things, not only in education. Uh, these are the points I'm making. So I uh, just uh, just look at the uh, uh, le let me just make go into a little uh, into a little review of our constitution. It has well the U.S. Constitution, which is the model I think of a brief constitution, is some uh, has something like uh, I, I took a, a little analysis of this uh, number of amendments sir what, are you talking about the number of amendments yeah. no i talk i'm talking about the words okay uh, about 4700 excluding the signatures ours in 1987 is uh, i forgot i i have it here much more much more much more yeah it, but i want to get the number right <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I always forget. I, uh, well, uh, they are. I, I get into this trouble whenever I talk. You can first finish the book, right? But. Uh, uh, okay, with 21,660, 21, the, the, I, I did this myself. Uh, <laughs> the 66, probably you added some of the titles or the, or the date. That's a lot. The preamble is 75 words when we could have said it in 10 words. The declaration of state policies 779 words well uh, we we have to state we have to declare the policy i guess that's why it's called the basic law sir it, it has yeah, to yeah. has to be basic yeah. rather than uh, the bill of fanciful. rights is 1442 the bill of rights in the us constitution is so much briefer and you know the bill of rights in the french constitution is even briefer 
than the than the uh, French Constitution. The briefest is the Magna Carta, sir. The briefest is the Magna Carta of the United because Kingdom. Because it just referred to the Magna Carta yeah. and so on. Uh, so uh, the magic of words. Uh, but the article on national economy and patrimony, how long is that? 1,745 words. All of the other countries probably have, if they had anything on national economy and patrimony, might have put it at 100 or maybe 45. That's why we're in trouble. I think we got this enlarged in 1987. In 1935 up to 1973, they were probably 1,500. Then the article on social and human rights, 1,438. Do you know the, the, the Constitution of Indonesia, 1945? according to a, to a summary made in 1987 by the Department of Information of the Indonesian government, list makes the uh, oh, I, I, I have it in my computer. I don't have it here. But sir, you can you can come in at any time, yeah, uh, even yeah, when we're no, just raise your hand. Yes, it's sir. only very brief. Ah. I tell you, ours is twenty one thousand. The the Indonesian Constitution enlarged by the notations of the Department of Information is was only one thousand five hundred words. That's why they didn't they didn't have any time to do all these kinds of special restrictions or special provisions in our constitution. If we have to amend the constitution, I guess we have to get a, wor uh, a word uh, uh, expert to make it brief. But, uh, but we are stuck with a, with a long and heavy constitution. We are here to undertake reviews and, uh, and, uh, and uh, amendments and so on. And I know, that I, I know you're, you're stuck with the words. And so you're just trying to make uh, introductions of amendments so that you have you have to amend certain provisions with uh, uh, unless provided by law, etc. So as not to destroy the wordings of the constitution. But I heard some wiser men who uh, I mean one of our justices who said perhaps in some areas we should use we should strike them out, abolish them, um, abolish certain words or provisions so that we can make it simpler. The magic that is in your hand is how to do between the unless provided for or the striking out of the provision so that we make it simpler. But let me just uh, uh, make that point. Thank you very much. That's very useful, and uh, we appreciate the scholarship and the perspective, uh, Dr. Sikat. Salamat po. Um, Mr. Chairman? Yes, uh, Senator Baton. Siguro kung i-translate natin yung 1987 Constitution into Filipino and or Bisaya, baka maging time strip pa, sir, yung uh, number of words. <laughs> kung maging time strip pa, <laughs> i-translate natin, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Dapat ikaw yung translator para umix eh. <laughs> Senator Bato. Kasi magaling si Senator Bato paiksin yung mga issue. I, I, I wish I could read the I, I wish I could read the little note that I had wanted to read. It's in my computer. Sir, you, you can retrieve it and then at any time we'll allow you yeah, to, I will, I will, to come in. I will yes, sir. It to you if you like. It's yes, please. A, yes. It's a commentary comparing uh, the Indonesian uh, the Indonesian uh, Constitution with reference to the Philippine Constitution. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sigat. That's much appreciated. Uh, can we hear from the IRI, uh, our International Rights Research Institute? We have Attorney Perez with us. Attorney Perez, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for waiting. umaga, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. And thank you for inviting IRI. 
I'm here on behalf of our Director General, Dr. Ajay Kohli, who's unfortunately away on research business abroad. So that being said, Mr. Chair, um, let me just share first what is the nature of ERI. We are an international organization. We are neither private nor public. I think we belong to that gray area of international organizations, which is either neither UN. In a sense, we are owned by the 19 countries that signed the 1995 five international agreement recognizing our international legal personality, and chief of which is the Philippines. And ERI is headquartered in the Philippines, truly a source of Filipino pride. In the agreement, it is stated there that the depository of our international agreement is the Philippine Department of Foreign Affairs. Uh, notwithstanding that, and being headquartered in the Philippines, we do have 10 other host country agreements, and some of them are in our Southeast Asian neighbors like Indonesia hosts us, uh, Vietnam hosts us, Cambodia, Laos, and some other countries in South Asia. We have two trustees who are Filipinos. They are the, Depart the Secretary of the Department of Agriculture and the UP President. So they sit in our board and they are part of our governance. While we are not subject to, we are not for the purposes of this hearing, Mr. Chair, we are not an educational institution. So we are not your competitors. We are purely a research organization and we are friends with everybody. In fact, our charter mandates that we are apolitical. In fact, I've cautioned even some of our uh, officers that we don't involve ourselves in local politics, whether in the Philippines or other countries. We do not try to dictate policy. It's up to the countries to decide. The same way we do our research for. We do our research, but it's up to the countries to deploy our research or if they want to use it. And our board chair now is Dr. Kao Dufat, he's Vietnamese, used to be the secretary or they call them uh, the Minister of Agriculture in Vietnam. And he always proudly says that 80%, 80 to 90% of the rice scientists in Vietnam were trained at IRI. And that gives us always a source of pride. And I take this opportunity to confirm what uh, Chancellor Camacho said, that we have close collaboration. In fact, we are hosted by the University of the Philippines at Los Baños. That's where our research fields and headquarters seats are located. And part of our collaboration is sharing our expertise with UPLB and even the Philippine government through Phil Rice. So that being said, we have not seen any provision in the present Philippine constitution that hinders our ability to collaborate share expertise, and work with our national partners. Hopefully, none will be forthcoming. So that, Mr. Chair, is our statement. And again, thank you for inviting us and allowing us the opportunity to present our views. You know, the common uh, or the conventional wisdom is that so many of the agricultural ministers and uh, rice scientists from Thailand, Vietnam, were educated at IRI. And the, the difference being that they were better at adapting the technology provided by ERI than the Philippines, at building the ecosystem, blah, 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 adapting technology, blah, blah. Do you confirm that, sir? We have, well, ganito po yung senator. It's a controversial thing because it might place in a position that we make judgment on a country, which we cannot do. But Not, uh, you don't have to uh, put down anyone, but you can just state the facts. Well, yes, some of the scientists have adopted. Some have adopted well, some have not. We've always, you know, one question that always comes to us, Po, is that we're always asked, how come we're importing rice? And we always say we cannot answer that because that's not within Iris' mandate, objectives, or even supplemental powers. We're just here to do research and give our technologies. In fact, our technologies, our IP, our public goods. But we also seek to protect them defensively, mind you, so that it does not, it's not, IP or IT, sir? IP, po. Intellectual, intellectual property. property. Yes. Okay. The fruits of research. So patents for certain varieties of rice? We have patents, but uh, as I always say, it's defensive in nature so that it's not exploited and unduly made exclusive by a third party to the detriment of the general public. And, uh, okay, uh, you seem to be, uh, you're playing safe, sir. Sorry, and I understand why. I understand why. But uh, in terms of adoption of patents, for instance, can you give us the facts for countries? 
I can give you the data. I don't have the data with you right now, Senator. Unfortunately. Okay. Can you? We'll just ask for the data, na lang. Yes. Yung how you measure. Uh, I'm sure you have performance indicators on the part of Erie, and uh, uh, I'm sure countries have their own performance indicators. But on your using your performance indicators, could you submit to the committee um, how countries have uh, adapted, uh, um, made it, made made the, or. Your recommendations have may have become mainstream policy in their countries, uh, Attorney Perez. I, para you don't get into trouble. Uh, we'll we'll submit it lang in paper, please. No problem, yeah. uh, Senator. Yeah. But if I may mention, a recent study was made. I think it's 2023, but it's CGIAR wide. Uh, IRI is a member of, is one of 14 other international research agricultural research institutions under the umbrella which we call the Consultative Group of International Agricultural Research Organizations or CGIAR. And a study was recently made, in fact, I downloaded the study on the impact of CGIAR research on countries. And that includes from rice and the uh, crops that CGIAR research as a whole include ones that were very common with garbanzos, uh, sorghum, millet, rice, wheat, corn, potato. So these are diverse crops wherein research is trying to uh, bring to fruit how we can make these crops more either productive or make farm or increase the impact for small landholder farmers. We'll, uh, we'll appreciate the reference to the study and then the, any other information, sir. Salamat po. Salamat po. Um, can we hear from uh, DTI, Philippine Trade Training Center Director Nelly Diliera? Ma'am, thank you again for waiting. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, Your Honors. <laughs> Um, we're actually supporting the proposed legislation uh, because the objective is to elevate education standards by empowering universities and higher educational institutions to establish international campuses in specific uh, countries globally. This legislation creates chances for students in the Philippines spanning diverse socioeconomic backgrounds to receive high quality education overseas, broadening the range of knowledge and expertise they can acquire. Moreover, it permits Philippine educational institutions to build connections and partnerships with foreign universities and higher education entities, facilitating the unrestricted flow of information, personnel, and academic programs. The law encourages innovation, fosters collaboration, and improves competitiveness in the higher education. And uh, while we are attracting investors, um, we should also entice international students to study here. Hence, the, the need for the Philippine education to become competitive, and we are particularly advocating the Philippine Skills Framework uh, towards this end. The Philippine Skills Framework, as uh, you may have heard, it is actually a reference document that's composed of career, career map, skills map, that also indicates um, this uh, description of a particular job role, the key tasks, um, critical functions, as well as the set of skills and competencies for a particular job role. Um, and these are documents, reference documents that can actually guide and be made use of by uh, the different educational institutions or even training institutions in updating the curriculum and even uh, the modules. Because this is um, um, contextualized by um, industry players and at the same time referenced on international standards. So we are advocating the Philippine Skills Framework because it holds significant import importance to transnational higher education by providing a standardized and globally aligned set of skills essential for the development of competitiveness of graduates. This framework serves as a quality assurance mechanism, ensuring consistency and excellence across educational programs and institutions operating in diverse international settings. By incorporating industry-relevant competencies, the framework caters to the needs of both global and local job markets, enhancing the employability of graduates. Moreover, it facilitates the mobility of students and professionals across borders as the skills acquired align with international standards, fostering a more interconnected and adaptable workforce. By the way, Your Honor, um, the DTI will actually be coming up its position paper. Um, this is just uh, for the Philippine Trade Training Center. We also have our colleagues here, of course, from PESA and, of course, from uh, the Board of Investments. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
uh, Tieza, Legal Officer Attorney Lani Cipres Salazar, ma'am. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Um, the authority is amenable to the proposed amendments on the certain economic provisions of the 1987 Constitution. Since the mandate of the authority is to develop, supervise, and regulate tourism enterprise zone with the primary objective of encouraging investments and to develop and manage infrastructure project and the principal agency for the collection of travel tax, 50% of which is allocated for TIESA and out of which 5% of which is earmarked for the development of historic, cultural, religious and heritage sites and prime tourist destinations and another 5% for the development of ecotourism sites in the press provinces with strong tourism potentials. Hence, allowing foreign investments here in the Philippines will help in sustainable economic growth and national competitiveness. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Attorney. Um, see, senior Immigration Officer, Board of Immigration, Anthony Cabrera. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Chair. Um, to the honorable senators, magandang tanghali po. Um, on behalf of the commission of my commissioner, um, honorable uh, Norman Tansinko, the Bureau of Immigration uh, on Senate resolution on both houses no number six entitled resolution on both houses of Congress proposing amendments on certain economic provisions of the 1987. Constitution of the Republic of the Philippines, particularly on Articles 12, 14, and 16. The BI poses no objection to uh, Senate resolution of both houses, number six, on amendments to certain economic provisions of Article 12, 14, and 16 of the 1987 Constitution. The BI also strongly supports the goal of the government to attract more foreign investments create jobs, and spur development. The BI shall continuously work with appropriate government agencies to strengthen the government's objective in regulating economic sectors that can be open to foreign investors. Thank you. Salamat po, uh, Officer Cabrera. Salamat po. Um, can we hear from the Philippine Association of Colleges and Universities, uh, TIP Associate, Joshua Alexander Calaguas. I think you've spoken already in the previous hearing, no? Yeah. Oh, anything new? Uh, I think, did you ask for time for a position paper? I think you asked for time, no, to come up with a consolidated position. Go ahead, sir. Yes, Your Honor. Actually, Your Honor, um, the invitation to the Philippine Association of Colleges and Universities was extended to the TIP. Unfortunately, they are not able to bring, uh, to, uh, to, give a representative and so we are here to represent their views. Um, we understand, Your Honor, that the TIP was invited because of the question on tech book and the um and the probability of building a tech book uh industry in this in our country or a, a tech book hub in our country. However, Your Honor, we respectfully uh, manifest that TIP is not a tech book institution. It does not offer um, technical vocational um, courses. Um, however, Your Honor, I, if I may take this time, because we have uh, talked to some of our members and we're still in the process of consolidating all the, the very important uh, insights of our members. However, our members are of the view and we support the Cocopea, the Cocopea's view of uh, opposing the amendments in particular to those that lift the foreign equity uh, restrictions in the constitution. Um, we, we will be submitting our position paper, Your Honor, um, by the end of the week, uh, as, as soon as, and as soon as we finish the consolidated reports of our members. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Uh, can we hear from PRC, Director, uh, Director Comafe and uh, Division Chief Rosales? Anything yeah. new from your, uh, are they here? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, hello. Anything Good. new from your side? Oh. Uh, from our side, we still maintain the same position as we provided in the last hearing. Okay, thank you. Peza, uh, Group Manager Attorney Jenny June Romero. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Yeah. Chair. Thank you for waiting. And to all the members of this uh, Honorable Committee, 
Uh, what is new with PESA, Your Honor, is that um, what is relevant for this meeting is our um, KIST, what we call the Knowledge, Information, and Science and Technology Parks. Uh, PESA concurs with the move to amend the economic provisions of the Constitution and open some industries to foreign participation. This move to lift the economic restriction in the Constitution is essential in this era of globalization and pivotal to advance in the race with our ASEAN neighbors in attracting foreign direct investments. Uh, under our present administration, PESA administration, PESA has diversified and redirected its strategy in economic zone development in line with its new thrust of eco-zoning the Philippines towards inclusive growth and sustainable development. Uh, your honors, under this new strategy of PESA, PESA, while preserving the dependable traditional land-based manufacturing economic zones, PESA will now embark in new frontiers of economic zone development. Some of these new economic zones are what we call the blue economy, um, aquamarine, uh, smart cities, mega eco-zones, and as I said earlier, what is relevant in this meeting is the KIST, KIST. It is the Knowledge, Information, and Science Technology Parks. What are these KIST parks? KIST parks, this will be established in the um, lands of campuses. Sorry, what type of park is that? Uh, it is KIST, Your Honor. KIST, Knowledge, Knowledge Information, uh... Science, and Technology okay. Parks. These economic zones will be located in big tracts of land. Uh, in our HEI, high, uh, Higher Education Institution, because we have um, state colleges and universities who have big tracts of lands, Your Honor, and these are just lying around. They are idle. They are wasted. So We're in danger of being uh, land reform yes, because the sir. DAR is uh, already claiming its government yes, lands because they're so, private. So, yes, sir. so mga this, SUC this, lands na kinukuha nila. So this, you have to... I think uh, you have to, tama yun, tama yung policy nyo. Sorry, sorry for interrupt. Yes, sir. So these SUCs, they could come to PESA and have this declared as an economic zone. And these KIST parks or KIST agro zones, um, they will be developed in order to strengthen and to give teeth and to give uh, fruition to all this um, innovation, science and technology initiatives of the country. Uh, the Philippine Economic Zone Authority under our Director General Teresa Opanga who is actually who went with the president in Australia, your honors, to promote the country. Um, and with DOST, uh, DOST and PESA, we inked a uh, MOA last year in August for the establishment of these KIST eco zones. Um, these KST parks will play a significant role in increasing the research and development infrastructure, fostering collaboration in R&D with foreign partners, facilitating technology transfer and upskilling our workforce towards... Meron na ho tayo niyan? Meron so, na ho. We have Saan the Batangas State University. Okay. And this is very um, very operational now. And We're fact, located? We're, we're uh, in Batangas Batanga City? Batanga, sir. Yes, sir. Batanga City? Batanga, yes, sir. Okay. And in fact, uh, it has um, been doing very good collaboration with our industries because some of our export companies, they... Um, and they, Nasa Batangas then. Yes, sir. Sa Tanawan and Santo Tomas. The economic zones yes. which are located near Batangas University. What are the eco zones in Batangas? As I, I'm aware of the Tanawan and Santo Tomas um, one. Uh, what? FPIP, Your Honor. Yeah, that's FPIP. FPIP. What are the so others? Some of our oh. economic zones located there who need immediate um, uh, skilled, what they call this? Workers. Workers. Yeah. They uh, partner with Batangas University so that the moment that this um, graduates will already be um, ready for employment. They are already absorbed by That's these good. economic zone um, companies. We also have three in the offing. We have uh, De La Salle, Lyceum, and the other one in Perpetual, the I Altahab. What's the third one, sorry? Uh, I Altahab, uh, Your Honor, under Perpetual Help. San po yon? I think in Laguna also. Okay. Um, this KIST IT Parks also is envisioned to be a center for technology transfer and commercialization and a platform to integrate various science, technology, and innovation initiatives in the region. Um, Your Honor, on this uh, context, on this note, PESA supports the amendment of the mentioned economic provisions in the Constitution to generate substantial investor interest to relevant industries <laughs> and heighten the country's competitiveness in attracting foreign direct investments. We likewise move and support the implementation of needed safeguards so that the country's 
national interest, sovereignty, and security will not be compromised while in the pursuit of our investment promotion agenda. Thank you very much. Thank office. you very much. Uh, it's very encouraging, uh, Attorney Romero. Uh, DTI BOI, Acting Division Chief Dino Recto. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Mr. Chair and uh, members of the Senate, honorable ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, the BOI's position is aligned with the position of our mother agency, the DTI, which supports uh, the call to amend uh, economic provisions of the 1987 Constitution. Given that the Constitution is a framework that provides fundamental principles of our government, we need a forward-looking policy direction to develop the Philippine industries and at the same time protect our national interests. The amendment will enable Congress um, to enact laws necessary to implement reforms necessary for economy. And with that, um, Mr. Chair, we would like to emphasize that liberalization of um, some of the sectors, for example, in our renewable energy, we had the BOI recorded um, growth um, with the RE sector when it was liberalized. From 2020 to 2022, it only had 423 billion pesos in, in, in approved investments. But after the liberalization, the RE, um, the RE approved investments surged to 1 trillion, 1 trillion, 88 billion, 979 billion pesos. With that, um, with that base benchmark, we can um, also look forward to the other sectors Having growing in invest, having growth in investments as well. Thank you. Uh, there are no other resource persons, but I'd like to throw this question to particularly to the DTI BOI uh, PESA. You were saying that we have these KIK KIST zones, and I think that's a very very uh, positive development. And you're providing the existing needs for the existing needs of the the workforce needs of the uh, locators and investors. Uh, but what about uh, the more advanced type of thinking? Like, who do we want to attract here? Because uh, that's also a uh, that's also a new provision in the or a new new way of thinking or philosophy in the create law. Na mas targeted yung incentives natin. So I guess you want to flip that question around. Who are we targeting, diba? Because I, I I'm reminded of uh, the news for the last few weeks. Nvidia, which is one of the biggest uh, companies in the world. It's now it's overtaken Amazon, which Amazon is, of course, is the rep, is supposed to be the new economy. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, that that type of uh, uh, not producing anything, but but uh, providing a platform for goods and services. For so, parang I'm wondering if that's a symbolic uh, change in the economy in, in the world economy when Nvidia overtakes Amazon. Uh, Nvidia, of course, is driven by the artificial intelligence or the AI. Uh, you know, boom. Uh, and they're also into gaming, uh, robotics, among others. So along those lines, what what is the thinking there in, in the DTI, the BI, uh, the BOI, the PESA? And, and anyone from uh, science, R&D, and the SNT network can chime in. Yeah. Mr. Recto, Mr. Yeah, Chief. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, if you look at the BOI's and DTI's positioning strategy, um, we can't, um, our promotions department can give, provide you the companies themselves that we're trying to promote or attract to invest in the Philippines. But in general terms, when we look at sectors, um, our priority sectors are, um, examples are electric vehicles, smart, high-tech, light manufacturing. So if you, if you remember some of the, um, the vacuum cleaners and the high-tech um, appliances that we already we already attracted into the Philippines. That's one of the examples or the benchmarks that we can provide. Uh, we also prioritize outsourced semicon assembly and tests, green metals, those developing um, copper, cobalt, or um, green and sustainability-driven um, products like the batteries for electric vehicles. Um, we also um, trying. We are trying to attract high tech agriculture, renewable energy, data centers. Not, and nothing on AI. Nothing on AI. That would go to the high tech. High tech. Chair. But I think you should put that. Uh, you should separate because that changes everything, right? And then it changes the whole education landscape. It changes the whole uh, the whole business landscape. 
in effect. It's already changing it, in fact. Yes, Mr. So, Chair. Um, actually, the, the general positioning strategy of the BOI is to make the Philippines a regional hub for smart, sustainability-driven manufacturing and services. When we say smart, AI is already considered in that regard. If you also look in the strategic investment priorities plan, um, the technologies of the fourth industrial revolution is provided the highest incentives among the activities. It AI, takers so far? A, um, not yet. There might be some, um, I'm not yet uh, at liber liberty to say, we have to go, I have to go back to my principles to provide an Can you provide that? Ano? Can you give us a... Uh some feedback on that because the create law was passed in 2021 april 2021 11. i think it took a, a time for the irr to also be formulated and there were a lot of debates there so i understand why it's a little slow to to materialize now yes uh, dr padilla is it on this topic yes yes go ahead we're, just, we're not yet in the radar of this team, but uh, as I said earlier, UP Manila is setting up a science and technology park at the new Clark City. We're actually in discussion with DTI as we it's speak a zone. right now. It's a PESA zone, yes. I assume. No? Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. And um, just to answer the question on the, uh, how to attract the locators, we have to understand how we can be competitive uh, by benchmarking with science parks overseas. So I personally have visited several science parks in Europe and in Asia, and I can see that one major factor is actually the incentives that we give to locators to come to the Philippines. So for our case, for the UP Manila Science Park, we have a consultation on April 2. We're bringing in about 40 to 50 locators who we think will follow the uh, um, our thrust. So this is health. And I'm glad that you raised the issue of AI because we're going to focus on diagnostics. We have identified the therapeutics that we want to focus in, specifically those that have been neglected by the country because we are just, um, we're just focused on the common ones, but there are new technologies that can be addressed. And definitely AI is actually in our agenda. So if you want to bring in uh, local, not only international, but not only foreign, but even local investors, we need to understand what they need because there is a community that we have to serve. In the language of the science and technology part, it's already a queen to helix. There are five components to a successful science and technology part. One is the academic pillar, and that means we need all the uh, universities, both private and government, to provide the new knowledge. The second point will be the government, and that will be DOST, DOST, DDI, DA, DOH, and so on. The third will be uh, the civil environment. The last one is um, the last one is actually environment, civil society, and uh, one that's always overlooked is industry. So as we visited different science parks uh, in more developed countries. Some of them realized that they should have brought in industry from the very beginning. So if we really want to attract both local and foreign investments into our science parks, we have to understand the needs of the locators. And I will, I'm will i more than happy to share workshops, materials that we have gotten from, uh, from, the, uh, from the meetings that we have attended. Please, but, please, please. But Can you share with us that. some of the ones you visited? Sino po yung, yung your modeling? Um, and then also in the yes, Quinto Helix, yes. you mentioned four. Oh, yes, Who's the yes. fifth? Uh, so, so academe, yeah. government, yeah. Industry, industry, civil environment, civil society. Who's the fifth? Civil society, environment, environment is the fifth ah, one. Okay. So I have materials on this topic, which I will be happy to share. Uh, we visited actually Malaga Science and Technology Park, which is uh, more than 30 years in collaboration with the University of Malaga and uh, the Definitely, this is the base of the International Association of Science and Technology in Spain, Parks. Malaga in Spain. Yes, we went to Seville, we went to Granada, and the very last one that we visited actually was Singapore. And uh, um, I mean, you know, I've seen Singapore from ground zero, and uh, uh, there are many lessons. We don't have to go far; we can learn from them. I'll be more than happy to share these materials with the group, with DTI, and also with your committee. Yeah, I'll recognize Dr. Albert, but first I want to finish with the. Uh, how about did you? Is Silicon Valley still a model? Uh, the biotech hub in 
Massachusetts, for instance? Yes, definitely. Are those models you're looking at? Yes, definitely, uh, Your Honor. Yeah. It's just that we're familiar with them. So we wanted to look at the other I models. See, there are 400 science parks in the, in the International Association of Science Parks, none registered from the Philippines. How about China? Did you look at China? Um, no, but I'm aware. So I actually know the model in Asia because when we set up the Philippine yeah. Genome Center, we already looked at the different models. That's why we decided to go outside. That's just because you're talking about health and I guess medical related, yes. science related technologies. But one of the biggest is Shenzhen. I mean, that whole echo zone there. Right? Yes, are, yes. Are you looking at that? Um, maybe in another... Um, we have, if you had the budget to go to all the places, so we had to prioritize Probably. where we were going to use the budget. But I would recommend visiting science parks to see how they actually move forward. I, I will share one story because this is, I think, going to be important for the locators. There was one big company that was about to locate actually in a science park in... In, um, in Spain on the last minute that was taken by a country in Asia. And the only thing that spelled the difference Vietnam or, was that Vietnam or Singapore? Singapore. Singapore. It was basically the taxes. They, the, you know, we have to really look at the policy if you want to come here. It was not a Taylor Swift concert. No, it was not uh, a Taylor Swift concert. Okay. But I, you know, we have so many lessons we picked up along the way and I'm more than happy to, to actually share that with the committee. Okay, thank you. We, I will appreciate the information on that. Yes, uh, attorney. Go ahead. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, regarding your question on what kind of industries that we wish to locate in this KIST or KST economic zones, we already have uh, formulated the guidelines as regards the uh, development or the establishment of these KIST eco zones. And uh, for this, we want our locators to be involved on the following um, industries. They will be involved in R&D and innovation areas of biotechnology, food and nutrition, agriculture, engineering, electronics, robotics, renewable energy, transport solutions, data analytics, artificial intelligence. Um, just for the information of the body, although it is not part of the KIST uh, economic zone, uh, just recently PESA was able to uh, get a uh, or register a company that is engaged in uh, um, biotech, uh, what they call this, biotech um, industry. Uh, this is Green Energy with Torrefaction uh, Technology Inc. company, wherein they would get all of these invasive uh, damo, uh, grasses. We have the buyo buyo. And because of uh, technology, they will convert this into energy, Your Honor. Great. That's something we need. But uh, you're thinking naman in terms of supply chains, di ba? Upstream, downstream. Para hindi lang iso in isolation. Because there's many cases of giving incentives, very generous incentives, but it fails because... There's no uh, complementarity uh, within the supply chains. So, gano naman tayo magisip ngayon. Yes, sir. Because ah. we are the DG, his trust now is to provide the best ecosystem in the economic okay, zones. Okay, great, yes, great. Sir. Kasi yan yung reason na tatalo tayo sa kotse, sa... and it might be the reason we lose again in EVs because China has everything there, you know. So, if we don't think in those terms, then, ano, or, or at least where we slot in, no? Baka kahit meron tayong momentary uh, opening, baka matalo rin tayo in the long run, di ba? Hindi sustainable. Yeah, Dr. Albert, you're raising your hand. And after that, we'll go to Mr. Santos, the president and co-founder of Thames International Business School. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just remember that last year, the PIDS uh, uh, had uh, as part of our theme for our annual public policy conference, the, the emerging twin economy where we're, rec twin transition, sorry, twin transition where we're recognizing a much more uh, greener, <laughs> and uh, more digital future. And I, I suppose many of our government agencies, including DPI, has, have already started to think about at least the digital part and they've come up with specific roadmaps to, but even me, I'm wondering because I, I always look at data and I'm wondering to what extent can we, can, can we benchmark ourselves relative to other countries. But um, I'm glad that right now I'm I'm doing a little bit of work on the green economy, but sadly, out of nine countries in ASEAN, we're number six. Uh, of course, I we're not calculating Brunei here, but out of so I'm I'm really saddened to see that uh, if we're taking a, 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 as far as at least the green the greener part, we're not preparing ourselves yet. <laughs> uh, why is that? Uh, well, there's so many things. I guess part of the reason is that the environment isn't really in our paradigm. 
most of the time. Uh, we can, we, we, there's a very big difference. Even now, we think of even the middle class. We try to, we're trying to grow the middle class, reduce poverty. They're practically this synonymous. But many people in the middle class, the very first thing, in fact, even in Ambition 2040, when people were saying, we want to be a middle class society where no one is poor. The first thing that they want is coche, to have a car. It, it's, it's in our mindset that sadly we, we think of these kinds of things, but we don't think of the repercussions of having cars rather than having, you know, having to use public transport. I mean, how many of even our government officials, including us, how many of us use public transport rather than, you know, putting put making putting more 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 problems to the, to the economy by using our private cars? You know, so those are things that uh, sadly are not in our mindset yet, and more so when you keep talking about climate change, you keep at the end of the day, what does climate change means to us? Many of us don't realize that we need cleaner energy. We need men to do many things, but it's not. Did yet you factor there. in that? Well, yung ranking six, what year was that? 2022. So, na factor na ba yung sinabi ni, uh, who said that? The BOI, yung re Renewable Energy Investments worth 1.88. Hindi 1. pa eh. Hindi pa. Kasi hours. parang feeling ko we're still not so there yet. So, medyo magpapago yun, di ba? Kasi we're, from we're 20 billion, yet, yeah, maybe, maybe a trillion. little bit, I mean, little by little, it's, we're getting yeah, there. So, maybe but, nga, medyo delayed lang tayo. Yeah, but, we're uh, delayed. Eh. And so, I, give I us just, your recommendations on how to further that, sir. How to move that uh, ranking along, Doctor? <laughs> well, no, right not, not, not now, but uh, because again, it, we want to be focused on the issue at hand. Yeah, but, but well, uh, that concerns us. Well, also. for me, the, the part yeah. of the issue is really also data because it's so hard, even in, in government, to try to ask where where, where things are. Uh, we are we tend to think that data is so easy that yeah. you know. So that, again, sir, uh, give us a laundry list, but now is not the time to. Uh, make it a gripe session against sure, uh, sure. government shortcomings. No? Sure, sure. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, next, uh, I'll get back to you, Dr. Patilla. I saw you raising. I was told by Senator Richie, you're raising your hand. We just have one more resource person, see, Mr. Joel Santos. He's the president and co-founder of Thames International Business School. Uh, on his online. Yeah. Hi, uh, Mr. Santos. Go ahead, sir. Good afternoon, Senator Angara, and to the other participants. So I was asked, to to comment whether I'm I'm uh, please correct me if I'm uh, uh, wrong that uh, whether I'm in favor of having a hundred percent foreign ownership for higher education institutions and tech book. am I right Senator yes uh, it, this is a hearing on the possible liberalization of the uh, economic provisions of the Constitution referring one of the one of these is the provision on educational institutions on ownership control management. But it also it, it it's wide enough to encompass uh, uh, teaching also uh, profession. So uh, we'd appreciate your feedback given your uh, work in this sector, sir. So yeah, this is a background for those who are. Uh, I am I currently a Philippine-owned hundred percent Ched Ched and Dep Ed accredited. However, we were one of the pioneers of transnational education, particularly in having foreign degree type uh, partnerships. We've been doing this since 1999. So why do I do that? Uh, so as a model, I have about seven university partners uh, in the UK, Australia, Singapore, and the US. And even though I'm able to give my own Philippine degrees, my students have the option to graduate among my seven partner universities. And, and why do I do that? On a twinning program, which is the technical term, meaning two years in the Philippines and two years in my partner universities. So why, even though I'm a degree granting institutions, why do I let my students choose where to graduate among my foreign university partners? And the reason is that we as a Philippine institution do not have all of the expertise and resources to provide our students the education they need for the skills of the future. So for example, my, my, uh, my partners, like the University of North Carolina, have a degree in biotechnology. I mean, I don't have a degree in biotechnology and I wouldn't even dare do a degree in biotechnology. They, my other partners would have a bachelor's degree in data analytics. So 
again, I would not dare to do that just to have a degree on data analytics because the fact is we don't have the lecturers and the expertise in the Philippines. So one of my other partners even has a bachelor's degree in entertainment technology. That's uh, that's under the state of uh, Pennsylvania, Millersville University of Pennsylvania. So, so again, these are not degrees that... Who is your partner for data analytics, uh, Mr. Santos? Uh, almost all of my partner universities, their also business... Better. All of them would have a business administration major in data analytics. I all see. of them. And so you're Pennsylvania? Uh, Sorry, I'm just trying to catch up with what you said. Uh, University of Pennsylvania, uh, Millersville University of Pennsylvania, bachelor's degree in entertainment technology. Entertainment technology, okay. So, you know, those, for example, are critical for our creative economy, right? As we digitize uh, our uh, creative industry. So those kinds of what I call new skills for the workforce of future are, are not some things we can teach now. So that is the reason why I have global partners. Now, if I look at the situation in the region, and then I will have my conclusion of whether I'm in favor or not. Uh, when I go to Malaysia and my other institutional friends there, Malaysia has... Uh, in the region, Singapore is known as the first education hub. Uh, the second one is Malaysia. So Malaysia has now a target of 250,000 foreign students by 2026. There are currently between 150 to 180 based on the unofficial numbers of the Malaysian government. And the reason they're able to attract uh, these foreign students of a hundred of uh, it's because they have allowed Australian universities, such as uh, the very first one who has entered was Monash University, and several other foreign universities from the UK and Australia have set up shop in Malaysia. So what this has done is they have become now a education hub after Singapore, and then India, just last. November 2022-2023 has just announced their new national education policy allowing foreign universities to set up in-country campuses. So, again, from a business perspective, I look at it now, maybe there's more competition. But from a nationalistic perspective, I believe that just like our neighbors, Malaysia, Singapore, and now India, we should really allow the entry of foreign education institutions to set up in-country campuses because we do not have the same ability and resources to be able to provide the, the needed knowledge and technology for the skills of the future. Of course, there are certain parameters, right? Uh, for example, if I could just share the India policy, they will not accept a foreign university unless that foreign university is in the top 500 in the global rankings, right? So they're not going to allow a diploma mill to enter the Philippines. So they will choose them among the top 500. So there are ways to allow foreign universities and our other country uh, neighbors, our neighboring countries, have already set up policies that I think we, could, should, we should learn from. So that's just my my uh, my input, Sen, and to the other uh, senators in there, is that I do agree that we should let foreign universities enter the Philippines um, as long as we have the right parameters to ensure that they really add value to our objective to once again become a knowledge capital in our region. Thank you. That's very good, uh, very useful. Uh, yes, Chancellor uh, uh, from UPLB. Yeah. So, so Mr. Chair, uh, let me add that uh, in in uh, the adding of value, uh, as mentioned by uh, Chancellor uh, Padilla and the previous speakers, uh, we are in that direction of uh, providing that value. Uh, for instance, the similar to the KISS uh, project of the Department of Trade and Industry, our proposed agro-industrial park in UPLB 
uh, a PESA zone uh, credited, and also our 10,000 hectare UP land grant is potential for these kinds of uh, uh, investments where uh, this, this, this uh, how aren't you already partnering sa UP with the uh, some of the energy producers just yes, sa may sa land grant sa, sa land grant we yeah. have the yeah. parang there's a wind farm or something that's no? right sir oh yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's, that's good that's now, good now oh. negotiation but every time that we receive uh, visitors uh, ambassadors uh, there are potential talks if I may refer to uh, Senator uh, De La Rosa's uh, remark earlier that in addition to the partnership that is being proposed, uh, iba pong mga proposals would be in these types of partnerships, meaning, well, if you may call them investment proposals, no, where uh, there will be interplay or engagement of our faculty and students to, to uh, uh, come up with a project uh, in this agro-industrial part. So that would be the, I would say, the, the value creation that can be uh, put into this uh, agro-industrial park and the land grant that uh, UPLB has. Thank you. We'll go back to Dr. Padilla, then we'll ask a question of uh, Dr. De Vera regarding some of the more geographically specific uh, needs of uh, maybe industry, like for instance, in Caraga, which is one of the, uh, if the administration is planning on uh, opening up mining, uh, and processing, I, I want to look at the value. We're talking about value added. Importante yung skills of, uh, of mining engineers, metallurgical engineers, among others. So we'll go back to you after Dr. Patilia, Dr. Dewar, in case you want to say something about that. Yeah, Dr. Patilia. This is really a, just to wrap up the supply process because, you know, we were talking about the tertiary education, getting the knowledge done. And then we got to the point of talking about KIS. Now, this will not work if we have that last part not addressed. And that is actually the, the policy on um, uh, buying the products of our science parks. It's going to be addressed by the procurement amendment. So I'm, I'm hopeful that that will complement all this conversation because we cannot be dependent on... Uh, uh, people from other countries coming here to work in the science parks. So we need the higher education for that component. But if government will not buy the products, we're back to zero. And from the experience of the science parks in the, our neighboring countries, uh, the GDP, it can act research and science and technology through research from higher education, uh, HAIs, contribute to as much as 4% of the GDP. That is actually the goal that we want to achieve. Um, the uh, it, where are, are we even, now? Where are we now? Oh, very low. <laughs> not even no, point, yes. point no, not, one of one percent because the like budget that. for research is so low. So, if I mean just look at the lessons we've learned, if we really put um, investment on higher education, producing the researchers, producing the products, and then getting government to be one of the major buyers, then uh. Even among ourselves, we will be able to contribute to the economy of uh, the country. One of our that's that's what you said is the goal of the Takfinot. It's to yes. create precisely those. Uh, that's why there's provisions for government yes. procurement there. I, I cannot say which country, but allow me to share this part because uh, this country is just at the same level as we are. But the economic strategy that they've uh, realized is that they've set up the the science parks. They have more unicorns than the Philippines, but they realize they don't have to look at foreign market for their products because they have 160 million population and they have to study their internal uh, processes for, uh, you know, buying the products of their local researchers. So I think, you know, we need everybody from the HEIs producing all of our graduates and the new ideas, but all the way to the policy of uh, buying our own products. And I look forward to the amendments on procurement because that will complement what we're discussing today. Thank you. And you know we're already in an advanced stage on that, uh, Dr. Padilla, because you've been very active there. Uh, Dr. De Vera, uh, any, anything to say on, uh, on yeah. that? And, and, and what is CHED's policy with respect yeah. to uh, that collaboration with the industry? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just two uh, short points. The first one is in terms of creating uh, these enterprise zones. Uh, 
I was working in the United States in California when this was initiated in the 1980s as a strategy to revitalize uh, communities uh, that are relatively poor by creating what they called enterprise zones so that locators can go there, be freed from government regulations, be given certain incentives. I think the point I'd like to raise is there was a study done by Stanford University at that time where, where they interviewed the locators in the enterprise zones on what made them decide to locate in those enterprise zones. The surprising finding of the study is that it is not the volume of uh, uh, incentives that was critical, but the correct mix of incentives. This is a 1980s study done uh, of uh, locators in enterprise zones in California. And the number one, uh, or not number one, maybe one or two most important elements that they were asking for was the workforce that they will hire in their companies. So that is where universities really come in. So the, the, the problem in California at that time was that the areas being offered was enterprise zones did not have the manpower that was needed because the conventional thinking was you provide a lot of incentives and locators will come in. But those locators were saying, it's not the volume, but the correct mix, particularly the human resource that they will hire. I think that is instructive for our discussion. This is a very old study in the 1980s span. Of course, the concept of uh, enterprise zones have evolved since then. But I think it is critical that our universities recognize their role in partnering with industry, in improving their facilities, their resources. Because even if PESA offers this to state universities and colleges, one major limitation is that our SOCs, instead of developing niches where they can really be very good, they tend to become or they want to be comprehensive universities. Instead of focusing on their core niche, what they, they measure their success in terms of how many degree programs they can offer. We've been pushing them to rationalize their degree programs. We've not been very successful in many areas because I'm thinking, abang mas madami kan degree program, mas university ka. Where in fact, universities that develop a very strong niche would be areas where enterprise zones can succeed because that is where industry will come in and partner with them. Uh, so that, that is what I'd like to contribute. We thank Congress because for two years now, Congress has put a special provision in the GAA instructing CHED to rationalize the degree programs of our state universities and colleges. So we've been trying, but this is a product of so many years, Mr. Chair. And it's not very easy to make the universities focus on majors. Congressman Paco, Dr. Develop, na pag usapan na yan. Yes. Eh, I, I remember we were talking about it before. Yeah. Lu, ano, lumang usapan na yan. Eh. Must be very difficult. Yes. But, but maybe Chet also has to look at the incentives it provides to higher inst yeah. learning institutions. Because to be considered a center of excellence or a center of, uh, what's the other one? COD? Development. Development. Yeah. You need to have certain number of programs na accredited, eh, di ba? To, yeah. to enjoy a certain degree of academic freedom, meaning yeah. hindi na kayo babalik sa CHED para yeah. ma-accredit kayo for certain courses. Baka yun ang, yun ang reason why they want to be a uh, university. So be able to to attain those uh, uh, informal seals of approval, yeah. di ba? Yun ang tingnan natin siguro. Yes. But I agree with you regarding yeah. your mention of the old study. It may be an old study, but it still holds true, I think, that really what attracts is the mix of incentives, not just the single, there's a, there's fiscal, there's, there's non-fiscal, there's non-monetary incentives. So dapat yun ang buong kabuuan nun ang tinitingnan po natin. And I totally agree with you. Yeah, go ahead, sir. Yeah, well, you mentioned about uh, Taraga State University. They have very strong programs in mining, engineering, and geology. Two degree programs where the demand is not just domestic, it is international. We are trying to encourage some of the other technology schools to do the same. Caragas gone very far in terms of geology programs. Aside from UP, Caraga probably has the strongest geology program. What are the new careers the that will be created by the, the incipient partnerships with Indonesia, for instance, for processing? 
Diba? Hindi na nila ma-handle lahat. They want to to help get our help. Eh. Will there be new courses created as a result of that? Dito pa lang, Mr. Senato sa Philippines, kulang na yung supply. The PNOC, when I was Vice President of UP, wanted to give a very big grant to UP, particularly for scholarships uh, for engineering because the energy sector cannot move very fast because our output of engineers was very low compared to what we need. So we're not even talking about Indonesia. Our the graduates of geology and mining engineering in the Philippines go to Australia, go to Canada. The demand, uh, even domestic, cannot be cannot be met. Uh, ang problema, Mr. Chair, mahirap magdevelop ng very specialized programs like geology, for example. Uh, we've instructed UP before to try to work with some of the SOOCs to develop geology programs. Medyo manipis kasi yung faculty complement. Mahirap mag-provide ng magagaling na faculty na may PhD kasi kukunti din yung schools na nag-offer ng PhD program. So it's a so, chicken and egg okay. uh, situation. Will, will, will any constitutional amendment or this constitutional amendment help in that respect? Uh, this is one of the reasons why we're supporting the constitutional amendment because one of the things that can happen is it will allow, it will send the signal to foreign universities that the environment in the Philippines is attractive for them to either locate here or work more closely with Philippine universities. What Malaysia did in their Edu City is create a whole zone purely for educational institutions because they wanted to rival Singapore as a transnational capital in the, in the region. But the incentives that they gave is huge. I don't know if we are ready to provide the same incentives or whether that will be the approach that we will take. But in order to attract the UK universities, they offered even the construction of the buildings. That's the volume of incentives they were ready to offer just to attract them to come in. And when I was there and I talked to the rectors of the university, the rector said, even with those incentives, it takes them five years to be able to earn a profit. So medyo, uh, the, of course, the Congress will have to flesh out the law on this. No? But as an initial step, uh, uh, sending the signals that we're open for transnational education to come in, to work with our universities might be a signal that will be very good to upgrade the educational system in the Philippines, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Chair. That's useful. Uh, I'm just wondering if the BOT can be used as a framework or a PPP in respect of that, uh, because then at least uh, there's a tangible benefit in the long run for the Philippines rather than just the benefit given short run to the foreigner. Uh, Senator Risa has, uh, I think Senator Antiveros has some questions for Chad and the other resource persons. Go ahead, ma'am. Salamat, Mr. Chair. Um... Opo, nung nakaraang hearing, nakapagtanong ako ng ilang tanong sa CHED, uh, kasama na tungkol sa Transnational Higher Education Act. Pero mer meron pa rin akong ilan para sa CHED pa rin. Though before those, um, yung isang napansin ko po sa mga pagdiding natin so far, Mr. Chair, so many issues and possible solutions uh, are being brought up on the economy and on improving education. But really, none of them seem to require 100% foreign ownership of public utilities uh, or educational institutions for that matter. So just saying lang po. Now to my other questions before, Ched. Um, Article 14, Section 5.2 uh, of the 1987 Constitution states that academic freedom shall be enjoyed in all institutions of higher learning. Uh, this includes the right of the school to decide for itself its aims and objectives and how best to attain them, free from outside coercion or interference. HEIs determine who may teach, what may be taught, how it shall teach, and who may be admitted to study. So, tama po ba, uh, Chair De Vera, na kung ipasa ang RBH-6, maipapasama sa constitutional protection na ito yung mga dayuhang eskwelahan? Uh. The academic freedom concept is a constitutional requirement. So it will depend on how Congress will flesh out the enabling law. 
uh, of course, we want to make sure that academic freedom as a principle is part and parcel of all academic institutions. But academic freedom is also not absolute. Uh, there are, you know, there is jurisprudence uh, determining the limits of academic freedom. So I think it will be determined if ever the constitutional amendment will happen on how and what kind of law Congress will enact, Madam, Mr. Chair. Um, fair enough, Chair. Pero so yung private, foreign private HEIs then pwede mag-grant ng autonomous saka deregulated status. Ibig sabihin, walang CHED monitoring at evaluation. O yung isang Chinese university, malayang ituro yung 10-dash line or kung anong gusto niyang filosofiya at paniniwala sa kabataang Pilipino, pwedeng mag-conduct ng research sa West Philippine Sea for academic purposes. So, at kung questionin, pwedeng sabihin na nilalabag na yung kanilang academic freedom. Paano po kaya yun? Uh, Mr. Chair, in the practice of transnational education in the region, even if significant autonomy is given to foreign uh, schools, the curriculum is still subject to the, to the ministry. They all pass to the ministry for their curriculum. That is the standard practice in Malaysia and in other countries. So there are limits also into how um, educational institutions will operate. So we can look at the practice if such a law will be enacted, I, it would be instructive to see the practices of other countries in the region and learn from it. Uh, I do not know of the hard and fast rule that will be applied right now, but uh, there is sufficient uh, lessons from the other countries that we can, or that Congress can study when, if, or, no, if, or when it uh, wants to enact an enabling law. Salamat, Chair. Pero siyempre, gayong ang dami nangang at dami pang problema natin, pangangailangan, na nangangailangan ng kalinga ng CHED, uh, baka nga mas maigi. <laughs> we we uh, look for and implement those solutions that don't require uh, opening up yung dagdag na uh, workload para sa CHED in the form of the the foreign HEIs yet. At least yung 100% foreign owned pa uh, dito sa Pilipinas. Um, Sunod po tungkol sa kapasidad ng CHED na i-perform yung kanyang regulatory authority. So sa ngayon, batay din po sa pag-aaral ng EDCOM 2 na inaabangan po nating lahat yung tabuan, may uneven development and capacities ang ating HEIs. At maging ang CHED bilang regulatory authority ng mga ito. So posible po ba na gayong limited ang capacity ng ating HEIs at pati ang CHED na madedehado? yung ating mga lokal na pamantasan, kung mabigang daan na yung 100% foreign ownership. Mr. Chair, kung ipapasa na ng Senado yung CHED bill, we will commit, we will have the capacity because that is exactly the challenge of CHED now. Our workforce is... Pending now in the Senate? Yes, it's Sa pending. committee or sa plenary? Sa committee. sa committee. It passed the House already, but it has been in the Senate for some time. The, com the, the, the employee complement of CHED now is about 50% plantilla and 50% contract of service. We're really operating on contractual basis. In fact... It's a pre uactea framework, eh, di ba? Yes. It's a pre, <laughs> yes. pre uactea pre-K-12 framework. Actually. It became worse, Mr. Chair, because of UACTEA. All the free higher ed staff in the region are contract of service. I would be the first to admit that it's very difficult because turnover, staff turnover can happen. It's difficult to train them because they might leave, etc. So, uh, as I said, uh, while we support the possibility of the constitutional amendment, it will require also a re-examination of the framework for higher education and what are the needed reforms. On its own, Pagka nag-constitutional amendment tayo pero hindi naman inamiyandahan yung framework ng higher education, it also will not work you know, the way uh, 
uh, supporters would would uh, would push for it, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. We would be the first to admit that kasi hirap kaming mag-implement uh, or mag-regulate dahil talagang manipis ang manpower complement ng CHED. Salamat, Mr. Chair. And again, uh, once uh, Congress can do right or do better by CHED, uh, palakihin yung complement ng commission na, na plantilya, Siyempre, yung isang approach ay i-prioritize yung mas mahusay na pag-aalaga ng CHED sa Filipino at Philippine-owned uh, HEIs bago pa isa pang layer ng mga posibleng 100% foreign-owned. Tapos, Sir Doris, yes, uh, of me, course. And, uh, just a quick interjection. Go ahead, Paul. Yung <clears throat> sinabi ni Chairman Popoy de Vera na pass na sa House and it has been languishing here in the Senate for uh, quite some time. Uh, sabihan ko lang sa iyo na, sabihan lang kita na, we are after of quality legislation here. Uh, hindi namin minabadali yung mga batas namin dito. Dahan-dahan lang. Yun lang. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Senator Risa. Okay, so thank you, sir. Senator Roy. Okay. Um, sorry. Uh, paano naman po mapapanatili ng ating mga HEIs lalo na yung binanggit ni Chair kanina na mga Centers of Excellence at Centers of Development, yung kanilang performance sa sakaling pagpasok ng mga foreign entities na nagpo-provide ng di umano mas mahusay o mas dekalidad na program offerings. Uh, Mr. Chair, siguro ang unang kailangan natin tignan is can we produce the policy environment conducive so that the top universities all over the world will actually set set up shop in the Philippines. I think that's the first one because we're assuming that they will come here in droves. I'm not sure of that if the incentive mix that we will offer would be enticing compared to the other countries in the region. I think that's the first one. Assuming that the mix of incentives is okay and they come in, it will require significant increase in government investments in higher education institutions for them to become competitive. As it is, our investments in our universities uh, pale in comparison to incentives for or to investment in higher education institutions in other countries. Kaya medyo malakas ang loob ng Malaysia na mag-open up because their, their support for their five national universities is tremendous. All the five national universities of Malaysia are ranked higher than UP. Uh, before, UP was higher than almost all of them. Now, UP is ranked lower than all of them, all the five national universities of Malaysia. When you go there and you look at their facilities, you will be amazed by the level of investment government has been putting. So that will be needed. If we're going to open up, we have to help make our higher education institutions also competitive. We have a lot of very good higher education institutions. Um, what, what are the indications? Their graduates are acceptable by foreign standards. Our institutions that produce our nurses, our doctors, our physical therapists, they practice all over the world. They're accepted, which means the quality of education is recognized. We have a lot of foreign students studying in Philippine universities. As much as 12,000 Indians at some point were studying medicine in our schools. Uh, a lot of Chinese uh, students are doing their master's in PhD in top Philippine universities. Uh, but competition, when they come in, we must be able to re-examine and also support our higher education institutions. I can imagine if MSU IIT was given more funds, MSU IIT is ranked in uh, QS Asia. They can be more competitive if we target, you know, support for key universities that can be globally competitive. I agree, Mr. Chair. And uh, again, uh, investing more uh, in our national universities or sa lahat ng ating uh, SUCs, higher education institutions, uh, wouldn't require 
uh, constitutional amendment. In fact, nandun na nga sa kasalukuyan constitution, highest budgetary priority for uh, education. Then, uh, at the same time, kaya ba ng CHED bantayan at salain ang kalidad ng programang ipapasok ng mga foreign entities kung sakali? O baka naman dumagdag lang sila yung mga iyon sa diploma mills sa bansa, uh, yung diploma mills na binanggit ni Mr. Lopez kanina? Uh, one strategy, Mr. Chair, is we determine who are the foreign universities that can come in. That is how other countries in the region have also approached it in the implementing rules and regulations about transnational higher education law crafted by CHED, only the top 500 globally recognized universities are allowed to enter into the Philippines. So that is one way of ensuring that if ever we create a positive uh, investment climate, that we get only the good ones. Um, that is a strategy that we have also learned from the other countries in the region, Madam Chair. With your permission, uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Top 500 in the world or in the world, po? Don't sa don't sa ranking because we yeah. Chair has identified three. Are ranking there, are agencies. the Philippine universities in the top 500 in the world? The Philippine universities. Where are we in the top 500? My worry, uh, Doctor De Veris, baka yeah. pagka may subject to reciprocity sa ibang bansa. Eh tayo, hindi tayo makapasok doon dahil sabi nila, eh hindi kami pinapapasok dyan eh. Hindi rin namin papasok. Dahil wala, kung, in case wala tayo sa top 500. So I'm wondering, yeah. baka yun yung unintended consequence ng ganong klaseng polisiya. Mr. Chair, depende do sa ranking system. But uh, UP, uh, Lasal, Ateneo, UST, uh, and uh, sino ba isa? Alam ko, top 200 tayo sa Asia. Yeah. Yeah. Pero sa world, parang, yeah. hindi, parang hindi yata. Nasa 500 something yata yung UP eh. Yeah. And Ateneo, somewhere thereabouts, no? Tama ba, uh, attorney? And, and San Carlos. Ha? Yeah. Ah, 1,000 daw tayo. Top 1,000, okay. Salamat, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, okay, well, top 1,000. All right. So, we have some way to go. Um, sa CHED pa rin po, sa so Article 6 naman po, Section 28.3, Nakasaad na all lands, buildings, and improvements actually, directly, and exclusively used for religious, charitable, or educational purposes shall be exempt from taxation. So kung ipasa po itong RBH 6, ibig sabihin po ba na yung mga dayuhang HEI exempted na rin sa tax? Depende po yan dun sa batas na ipapasa ng Kongreso. Uh, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to determine it now. Mr. Chair. All right. Salamat po, Mr. Chair. Uh, ang, ang huling tanong ko po para sa CHED ngayong, ngayong hearing, Mr. Chair. Uh, Nag-look into na po ba ang CHED sa pagpo-promote o pagpapalakas sa Transnational Higher Education Act? Na itinanong ko po nung nakaraang hearing, mukhang mahusay na batas at hindi pa talaga na maximize o na optimize ang pag-implementa. Tinitingnan na po ba ang CHED iyon? Uh, Mr. Chair, madami na po nangyari even before the transnational education law was passed. Uh, for example, we have a very successful project between Philippines and UK universities where we partnered the Philippines and UK universities to develop niche programs at the master's and doctoral level. And there are 13 master's and doctoral programs jointly offered by Philippines and UK schools, including UP Los Baños with the University of Reading and I think University of Liverpool. Uh, meron na yung, yung mga twinning arrangements, uh, nag, nagawa na po yan, uh, even before the transnational higher education. Yung transnational higher education law has sent a clearer signal for foreign universities who are interested in the Philippines. So for example, Kamusum College in Victoria in Canada is setting up a campus in Pampanga, I think this year, together with Miriam College on a uh, joint, joint degree program. Yeah, so it, it sends a clearer signal. Uh, Will that be enough? Uh, that is always the question. Can we just depend on it? Yes, we can. We can just depend on it. But 
compared to the other countries in the region, they will be more attractive for transnational education compared to the Philippines because our policies are more restrictive. Uh, so that that is that is uh, medyo pwede pero medyo mahirap. Uh, kakayanin ba? Kakayanin naman pero compared to the other countries, they will probably have more successful transnational education than us. That would be that would be my answer if the question is can we just rely on our transnational education law to foster internationalization? Salamat, Mr. Chair. Of course, sabi nga, eh, our policies are more restrictive. Dinadebate pa nga natin yun, eh, kung more restrictive nga ba or mas liberal nga ba. At kung policy nga yung problema, then as when CHED uh, championed the passage of the Transnational Higher Education Act, then pwede po talaga natin i-approach pa rin yung, yung sitwasyon through, through legislation dahil Baka hindi naman lahat ng mga bansang sa ngayon mas matagumpay sa atin sa edukasyon in our region achieve that success because they amended or revised their their constitution. Salamat po ng marami at Chair Rivera. Mr. Chair, do I still have time for two more questions or sa next round na lang po? I think Senator Bato has, has no question. So you, you have the you have the floor, ma'am. Salamat, uh, Mr. Chair. Just, uh, I think, two or three last questions. Sa... One. Uh, Mr. Chair, last question na lang pala. Uh, if I may ask uh, Dr. Ledesma Laurel, ma'am, um, I'd like to ask about your assessment of uh, the current capacity of our educational institutions to develop and offer higher education programs. So, in advocate po ba yung kakayahan ng mga higher education institutions natin na makapag-provide ng access to better higher education? Um, right now with technology, even an ordinary uh, classroom in Cotabato, where I come from, can have Harvard professors in the classroom because of technology. Um, we don't have to spend for their accommodation on their fare uh, technology has made it easy for global credentials to be available to any ordinary Filipino. Um, and that is the difference between then and now. Um, if, you have the, if you have the will, the political will, you can actually navigate the internet. There are excellent resources in any, in any field. You can be a PhD level in terms of knowledge, and it is available. So uh, right now, uh, Southville uh, Global Education Network, one of our schools actually, has been offering um, UK degrees and uh, Australian degrees, but it is subject to the management control and governance of Filipinos. Um, I, I think I stressed earlier that with the geopolitical situation, it is very risky to just allow um, foreign investments to come in in education. You know, it's very easy for a country that does not believe in democracy to offer subjects in the name of global education, which may actually be um, brainwashing and indoctrination of philosophies and policies that are inconsistent with our national ideas. That was our biggest problem when we had offers of partnerships from other countries. The partnerships that we have right now are very streamlined and very well studied in terms of content. And because of the learning management system, we can actually observe what's going on every minute if we want to in terms of what is being taught. And so therefore the franchising arrangement has been with us for the last 28 years. And we have had really uh, uh, graduates who have made it in the global arena, in the Philippines and the global arena. And it does not, does not deter, deter any Filipino from franchising with the top universities overseas. So that's our experience. And I think I shared earlier 
also the perils of having foreign ownership because you cannot, they can always relabel the subjects. And so it will pass through filters. But in reality, on a day-to-day -day basis, can we really, can we really see what's going on? One foreign, uh, one foreign partner, we look at the curriculum, it was a very, very uh, uh, seductive offer, but uh, we just said no because it went against our our ideals and we know the background. We know the background of the people that wanted. So, so that's our experience. 28 years of transnational education before the TNE policies and standards were crafted by the CHED. And yet we have had experience of how to invite and how to attract foreign schools that are top in their countries without having to relinquish our, our control of the curriculum that's that's taught. Um, and especially at this point, with the very sensitive geopolitical situation, it's very risky. Salamat, uh, Dr. Ledesma Laurel. I appreciate your emphasis also on at this point, conjunctural. Yung mga bansa na uh, kaalyado o kaibigan natin on may not be that way in their behavior towards us now. O yung mga uh, kaaway natin, no, nakagera pa natin ngayon, ngayon, noon ay kaalyado natin yon in the changing uh, matching of national interests of, of different nations. Kaya importante na um, updated tayo at saka uh, adaptive din. And you mentioned 28 years na kayo in this field, so it's practically one generation's worth. So medyo... Uh, solid yung learnings and they can be, I believe, shared, replicated, scaled up with other uh, educational institutions yeah. uh, in the Senator country. Lisa, with yes, your Mr. permission Chairman. and the yes. permission of Dr. Ledesma. Version to make it Philippinized. Like the cases, we use Philippine cases, even if it's taught by UK University. Right. Because that's how to marry both Asia and, and the West or, or Europe. Yeah. So uh, that's where the control is very important. Yeah. Uh, with your permission, I just heard a resource person say there are many free uh, resources taught by Harvard professionals. But but it, it's still different from having a Harvard degree, diba? At the end of the day, you can take as many free courses as you like, but uh, no one will hire you on the basis of the free courses you've taken. Diba? It's still a credential, credentials world. Am I, am I correct? I mean, it, it will help you in practice, but to get your foot in the door, you still probably need that that degree. Uh, it's not quite the same thing, no. Uh, I agree. There's been democratization, and and that's very important in terms of upskilling, etc. Pero ibo parehong yung may degree, di ba? It's not quite the same. I don't think that's uh, apples to apples, uh, Doctor De Vera. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Our representative of Philippine Science High School earlier said that they have a lot of graduates who qualify for American universities, but very few end up going there because of cost. One of the things why we are supposed to supporting this, uh, this initiative is that we can provide additional options to students to pursue their education in foreign universities here. And this can be subsidized by government funds that are more cost effective. Uh, my apos are also in a science high school and you know, they just did a tour of American universities and they, they came home and they said we cannot afford it. Uh, madami tayong magagaling na graduate ng science high school sa so can compete uh -huh. with the best, but they, their access is limited it's because restricted. they cannot, yeah. for, the foreign institutions cannot set up shop in the yeah. As a rejoinder to that also, Chair, that's a good point. Pero yung, I know a lot of people also who uh, availed of the programs of NUS and the uh, I think it's HKUST or, or some of the Asian universities who partnered with Harvard, Yale, and Northwestern to provide those degrees because they're not as expensive as a, if you're paying uh, several million to go a year. It, it's only several hundred thousand, I think, in the case of the Asian uh, university. So that's right. I, I agree with you there. It, it, it's, it's providing options. That's one of the impetus uh, for filing this, this actually. So yeah, thank you. Mr. Chair. Sir. Ah, salamat, Mr. Chair. May pangatlong gusto kong i-appreciate na point na binring up ni Dr. Ledesma Laurel. Um, you, you actually referred to the matter of national security, which was also mentioned in passing in 
uh, earlier hearings. Alam kasi natin that there are countries that have conducted or are conducting disinformation campaigns or influence operations in other countries around the world um, to, to shape or change opinion environments about geopolitical issues, uh, to, to try to distort narratives. And kung sa social media space, which is a, a, a non-formal education setting, ano pa kaya sa formal education setting? Kaya gusto ko lang i-appreciate din yung word of caution that you raised about that. Uh, isa ring dahilan na tama, as many resource persons have said, uh, in our relations with uh, uh, foreign higher education institutions, uh, whether the RBH6 is passed or not, na importante. And it, it was the experience of other countries as well. Selective talaga. And depende sa particular national interest na sinusulong. And in the case of some, time-bound talaga. Kaya na-appreciate ko rin yung punto nyo about at this point. So conjunctural din yung approach. Uh, just as uh, last couple of questions uh, to Dr. Ledesma Laurel. Um, so, uh, ah, well, but maybe this has been debated on both or more sides around the table, but I, I had wanted earlier to ask you, why allow the influx of private and foreign providers of higher education uh, when it appears uh, wala naman yung inadequacy and incapacity ng ating mga HEIs. But I guess this has been addressed around the table, Mr. Chair, yung all the improvements and reforms we still want to to uh, address. But would, as a, maybe as a last uh, question to Dr. Ledesma Laurel, Mr. Chair, would RBH6 address those concerns, all the problems we want to solve, all the reforms and the, the improvements, the leveling up that we want to do? I think the initiative of bringing in foreign, competent, and prestigious universities would be on the area of, a, of the context of a globalized economy. If they have, for example, management cases from all around the world as against only Philippine cases, they would be more prepared to, to, to be part of a, of a global scenario and to be to to stand to stand well in terms of global employment yeah and we all know that even if you're in the philippines you can actually work globally because now your employer is not only philippines but really the global market so that's the beauty of uh, having foreign universities uh, participate in local institutions but i would always stress that it is still better that the filipino looks at the curriculum very closely because the youth is in peril if they're given ideologies at a very young age because their minds are very vulnerable at that point. Thank you, Dr. Ledesma Laurel. Marami salamat, Mr. Chair. Those are my questions for today. Thank you very much, Senator Risa. We'd like to acknowledge the presence of uh, Senator Francis Tolentino, the Senate Committee Chair on Justice. Sir, anything from you? Just listening intently to the discussion. Probably would butt in along the way. I think the discussions earlier on science and technology would interest would have interested you very much, being a supporter of the science sector, sir. Uh, anything else uh, around the table? Uh, yes, uh, Chancellor from MSU. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just would like to uh, go back to the discussion on the role of uh, educations in um, generating innovations and that of uh, the industry and academic partnership. One of the things that I think that we need to look into and probably address is the fact that um, we do not see much of uh, private or industries investing on R&D in higher education institutions. If we compared our, um, uh, um, our universities with, with, um, with our neighboring countries, it seems that much of their R&D income are coming from private sectors, not actually from the government. Uh, and, and I think that's the missing link if we really wanted to strengthen uh, academia and industry partnership. Otherwise, um, um, uh, the issue of commercializations of the innovations of uh, university would be very, very difficult. So perhaps um, uh, the, the Senate may look into how do we incentivize industries 
in giving um, a research grant to to um, um, universities. Mr. Thank Chairman, you. Professor, how, how, would you, Go ahead. how would you comment on uh, current initiatives as well as ongoing engagements, for instance, by uh, ANSI with the Na National University, Gongwei Group with the De La Salle University, MBP Group with the Sandeda College and even Ateneo. These are probably, this would probably answer some of your concerns. Yes, uh, uh, that 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 is uh, uh, precisely what we hope to see more in in higher education institutions. But if you see that it's very limited to to these higher education institutions, um, 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 I think we can count, um, especially in state universities, where you really see uh, much of the R and D are coming from uh, private sector. I'm referring not just to sports development programs, basketball teams, volleyball teams, but the entire R&D hub being supported by uh, various tycoons. Isn't this an ongoing concern? We need to further uh, encourage that. I think we need to further um, um, come up with um, uh, programs that I think that um, this industry would also invest in. In, so are you look at, looking at the possibility of uh, foreign business conglomerates entering the Philippines, for instance, Ford Motors, Toyota Motors, investing in Mapua School of Engineering, UP School of Engineering, uh, among others? Yes, is, is that's that... exactly what we hope to see. Just like, for example, in Japan, in, 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 in Taiwan, in Singapore. You see corporate laboratories in in universities. With your permission, yes. Senator Tolindo, na banggit yun Toyota. Actually, Toyota Tesla will confirm this. Toyota put up a training institute, di ba, sa Santa Rosa, which uh, provides more advanced uh, uh, training for our countrymen. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. But Professor, uh, can't we consider previous engagements, not just by manufacturing firms or big corporations before turn of the century, for instance. Americans, uh, for instance, a big Protestant group investing in Siliman University, or for instance, a, the, the group of Belgian priests uh, investing in Notre Dame University in Cotabato City. Uh, aren't this worthwhile? Investments, likewise, not not re, though not related to your research and development investments made, uh, for instance, by the Jesuit group, Ateneo. These are investments made in inculcating values, not, not just not just uh, religious education, good manners, etc., uh, etc. Et Isn't that sufficient? Well, I, I, I do um, agree with, 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 the, with the senator. Um, I think that is just one of the areas uh, in terms of um, um, value formations. Um, I think in some way or the other, um, we have also benefited from, from that kind of um, indoctrinations. Uh, but I think I am looking at it at the, the, the economic point of view where we currently we do have a uh, barrier to entry uh, in terms of... Uh, financial um, uh, investment to higher educations. So we need more. Definitely. We it need would, more. It definitely would, would help. Not of the same, but of a different uh, value added to our economy. For instance, uh, not just engineering, uh, not just your top of the line technology. So as what the previous, I can't, I'm not uh, diagonally located, ma'am. Can't see your uh, nameplate, but it's it's the globalized uh, setting that would require us, following your line of thinking, uh, to open more. Uh, and it's not just the investments financially to put up more infrastructure in terms of universities as research hubs, but uh, investments that would upgrade the human mind in terms of 
uh, uplifting not just the spirit and culture but uh, how how we would be thinking 20 or 30 years from now is that what you mean I agree uh, mr. Ch um, uh, mr. senator just like for example if we we can have the Japanese culture for example uh, their their kind of uh, corporate governance being also um, uh, put in place you know, um, in our environment we can learn from it um, we don't have to to benchmark in Japan but if we have Japanese universities or Singaporean universities in in, in the country then it would really help also our universities to learn uh, uh, the kind of um, uh, corporate cultures that these um, universities embody and, and you're correct uh, professor speaking of Japanese universities the Soka Gakai University system uh, would have wanted to enter the Philippine educational market decades, decades since, I think, 30 years ago. Hindi uh, sila makapasok dito. They just uh, put up some uh, cultural centers, but they would have wanted to enter the Philippine educational uh, sphere. No further questions, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh... Those contributions, Senator Tolentino. Uh, Steve, Mr. Santos, I think he's, I was told he's raising his hand. He's online. Mr. Santos, ah, you wanted to say, contribute you. to say something? Huh? Yeah, thank you, Chair. So maybe if I could just offer uh, another point of view on the benefits of uh, having foreign institutions in the Philippines from the perspective of education tourism. So, of course, when the foreign universities set up campuses here, there is the the target of having Filipino students enroll in them. But the other perspective is actually attracting uh, international or foreign students to come to the Philippines, which has been the strategy of Australia uh, before the pandemic, the Australian economy um, outside of agriculture, number three would be its education. And for example, to just give you clearly some numbers, when uh, Malaysia has opened up itself, positioning itself as an education hub, as an alternate to Singapore under education tourism. Pre-pandemic, they had 7.2 billion ringgit in revenue from tuition fees and other services. So that's around 85 billion pesos from foreign students. Now, Thailand is beginning to ramp up its educational tourism promotions. So we are very far from there are hundreds of thousands of students uh, that are coming. And so, I, again, just to share that, you know, when you invite these foreign universities, given that they are global universities with very good reputations, it is not only for the local students, the Filipino students, but we will also be attracting um, international students. And as I said, Thailand is already ramping up its educational tourism promotions. Thank you, Cher. Thank you, Sir Santos. Uh, anything else? If uh, I think everyone's gotten a chance to speak, any uh, closing remarks? Uh, if not, we'd like to thank you for attending today's session, which has been quite productive and informative. And we thank our government officials and resource persons from both public and private sector. Marami salamat, especially those who came from Mindanao and Los Banos and uh, from further afield. Uh, maraming maraming salamat po sa inyo. Thank you. Thank you.